for doom. Ontogeny.
Ellie, boot off the door locks. I don't want you on this game right now. What are you talking about? You've been on Kill 'em Up games all day and all yesterday. It's because my new favorite game. I don't like it. You know? This isn't right. I was laying in my bed last night thinking about that, bro. Like, if I just, like, took a shovel and I just started to dig into my grass, I wonder when I'd hit the ocean, bro. This isn't right, this, this might be the right, Father. Dinosaurs lived a long time ago. They were terrible lizards, don't you know? Some ate plants, some ate meat, some ate fish, and some ate beets. Well, hello, hello, everybody. Happy Monday, and welcome to Paleontologizer. We're all having a great day so far. I hope you all had a wonderful weekend. Welcome once again to our little corner of the internet. Um, if anybody's here for the very first time, whether you're watching live on Twitch right now, and hello, hello, all of chat. I really hope you're doing well. Or whether you're watching from the future in a VOD or maybe on YouTube, since we put all the VODs up on YouTube nowadays. Hello, hello, and welcome to Paleontologizer. My name is Danny Anduza. I'm a dinosaur paleontologist. And uh, here on Twitch, it is my job to try and peel back the curtain and show you how fossil science works. I'm taking paleontology, you know, a noun and trying to make it a verb. Show you how it works. Paleontologizing. I don't know. Does that make sense? Anyway. Uh... Yeah, I'm a dinosaur paleontologist, so I work on dinosaur fossils in particular. I dig them up, I study them, and now I publish on them and uh, talk about them five days a week here on Twitch. XF Kirsten, thank you, thank you for the 20 months of support. I hope you had fun, XF Kirsten. It's great to see you. Thank you so much for the 20 months of support. That means a lot to me. It really does. Thank you for keeping this stream going. Believe it or not, this is my full-time job nowadays. Um, it's kind of silly to say it, but I actually make more money doing this than I've ever done working for a museum or anything. I don't make a whole lot, but you're helping improve that awful waffle. Holy cow. Ten gift subs there. I think you may have overloaded our Tinamu bird here. Um, might want to back away slowly and... Uh, I want to take cover. AWFULWAFFL3 is overloading the system. Thank you, thank you, Awful Waffle. Holy cow! With those 10 gift subs. And then five months of support there, too. Thank you, Awful Waffle.
fantastic. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Seriously. Uh, the the fact that I can afford to do this, that I make a I'm able to make a modest living on this website and and do science outreach full time is like a dream come true. And it is thanks to wonderful folks like yourself. Awful waffle. Thank you, thank you for that. And uh yeah. If any of you happen to get a gift sub from Alpha Waffle, well, I hope you enjoy those emotes. I hope you enjoy not having to watch the ads. And thank you, Lunaseer. Lunaseer, how are you doing? Welcome, welcome. Thank you for that gift sub to Dr Graxanov. Graxanov, enjoy. Thank you, Lunaseer, for your generosity. Holy moly, everybody. Uh, this is supposed to be his anonymous... Luna Seer, have you been giving anonymous subs? Luna Seer, I appreciate you, and I'm sorry that Twitch blew your cover there. You know what? I didn't see anything. Who? Thank you, anonymous gifter, for that anonymous gift sub. One thousand bits appreciate can make you. A wonderful difference in promoting the appreciation. Yeah, I can. And understanding of fossil science here on Twitch. Thank you, Nafron. Holy cow! A thousand bits there, Nafron. Spectacular. Thank you very, very much. Holy cow. Yeah. Um, not yet, not here. Lol. <laughs> go, uh, Lunas, I mean, anonymous viewer. Thank you, thank you. Yeah. Holy cow, everybody. We're going to have a fun stream today. Uh, yeah. It's going to be kind of a loosey-goosey one. We're kind of going to be following things where they lead in today's live broadcast. We'll probably be continuing that uh, that old documentary about the AMNH field crew in Mongolia digging up Cretaceous dinosaurs like Overaptor, now called City Patty. We might talk about that. I know Claire Burr requested City Patty as a dinosaur deep dive a while ago, and we will get to that. I uh, I assure you. But uh, yeah, yeah. Anyway. Before we get to any of that good stuff, though, and before we check out some fossil news also, let me scroll through chat. We'll see who's here right now. We'll say some hellos. And then, uh, then we'll get our science kicked off for the day. Uh, Let's protect our fossils, because if they're removed, America loses them forever. And Lunas, I mean, anonymous viewer, Lunas here. Did you just convert a gift sub into a recurring sub there? Anonymous Seer? Lunonymous? <laughs> thank you, thank you, Luna Seer. I really appreciate you. Um, <laughs> thank you for that Lunonymous uh, uh, upgrade to your sub there. I, I really appreciate it. I really do, Luna Seer. Thank you, thank you. You're, uh, you're wonderful, and your support means the world to me. So thank you for... Uh, shoot. Thank you for helping keep me going here on Twitch. Me. It means a lot. And uh, yeah, Luna Sears uh, ontogenetic stage might go up with that resub there. Uh, who is here in chat? Lenina, how are you doing? Welcome, welcome. Hope you're doing well. Kodali, what's shaking? Uh, great to see you. Brainington the third. Hey yo to you too. Welcome, welcome, Brainington. I saw you had a really good question about ontogeny a little while ago. We'll get to that in a minute. Um, tactile 3D picture. I've been very busy this weekend. But, um, I did see your message now, and shoot, I'm going to have to sign up for Facebook, I guess. And, uh... Now that I'm an adult, my life is in ruins, so I'm halfway there. <laughs> Mr. Tim, thank you for those hundred bits and for that joke. I appreciate that. Yeah, archaeologist. Well, how does the old saying go? Uh, the difference between an archaeologist and a paleontologist? No expense. I forget how it goes. Anyway. Um, glad you're here, Mr. Tib. Let me know if you want some tips on how to be a paleontologist. Or how to get involved in paleontology. Yeah. Now that it seems like you're halfway to archaeology, Mr. Tib. Um, and thank you, Anonymous Gifter, for that gift sub there. Appreciate that very much. You know, folks, we've got a hype train going here. Sounds weird when I say folks like that. You know, chatters, everybody. We've got a hype train going right now. Uh, approaching a level four. I'm 
Plantageny. <laughs> Ironheart 50, thank you for the 31 months of support, Ironheart. That is extraordinary. You've been here, like, since the very beginning, Ironheart. Or close to it. I appreciate you for it, Ironheart. Holy moly. Thank you, thank you. That's extraordinary. 31 months. Beautiful. Yeah. Uh, very, very nice. Um, who else have we got here? A truckhorn. How are you doing? Howdy, howdy. Uh, Arle, Tradune to you too. Arle, I hope you're having a good day. Hope your weekend was good. It's good to see you. Uh, SBism says dino time. You're right about that, SBism. Welcome. Welcome. There is Brennington's question. Let me copy and paste this into a, a note here so I don't forget it. There we go. I'll put that over here. And, uh, yeah, Brainington's wondering about the difference between Stegosaurus and Hesperosaurus. And that is something I've wondered about myself. We'll explore that in a little bit. Yeah. Um, yeah. But before we get to that, here, check on my 3D printer for a second. I gotta go check on something else. We're printing the Iguanodon Thumb Spike today. Hang tight. Yeah, already off to a good start. It should take about six hours. I gotta keep checking on this, because last time we had a print error and it failed. And I lost all that progress. So, yeah. Yeah. Um, Maskling is changing their name to Give Them Nell. Well, Give Them Nell. Looks like it's already gone through. Uh, thanks for letting me know. And Layer T says, three hours sleep and I forgot it was a dinosaur day. I think fate brought me here this time. Great to have you here, Layer T. Thank you, Fate. That's excellent. Blonde Bean says, it's a birthday dino stream. Is it, Blonde Bean? I suppose you could say that. Welcome, welcome, Blonde Bean. Yeah. Uh, and... Excellent. Hype train success at level three. Beautiful. Very nice. Thank you for all the support, everybody. Look, we're out of 12 subs out of our 40 goal for the day. It's an excellent start. Holy moly. Thank you for uh, for all the love and support. I really appreciate that. Yeah. Birds of Dead On is here. Howdy, howdy, Birds of Dead On. Fall Machine. What's shaking? Uh, Jody Fish, good afternoon to you and yours, Jody Fish. Ash K, what's up with you? It's good to see you. Uh, give Nelson's aloha, Danny. And uh, aloha, are you saying goodbye or hello or both? Give them Nell. Well, yeah. And, uh, I sound tired? Do I really, Lunasir? I don't feel tired. Yeah. Is there something wrong with my microphone? Hmm. Hmm. Yeah. And, uh, Arya... Arya... <laughs> Arya Kijaria, how are you doing? Welcome, welcome. I'm sorry it took me so long to get to your message, Arya Kijaria. But welcome to Paleontologizing. Honey Pixie, how are you doing? Welcome, welcome. Lizbert, hello, hello. What's shaking? Good to have you here. And uh, Entheon says, you owe me an a paleontology. Dinosaurs, probably. Entheon. I can't say I've ever heard that one before. That's an original for me. Welcome, Entheon. Entheon. It's good to have you here. Uh, there's all those gift subs there from Awful Waffle. Excellent. And, uh, Kirsten, glad you're doing well. Uh, Golgonek, what's shaking with you? Always great to see you, Golgonek. Hope you had a wonderful weekend. Dr. Javasaurus, hello, hello to you. Welcome back to Paleontologizing. And Dr. Javasaurus says good morning, so in response I say good afternoon from the beautiful, sunny San Francisco Bay Area. No, this is not sponsored. I just think it's funny. Um, <laughs> if I could get sponsored by some sort of Bay Area Bureau of Tourism, oh man, yeah, that'd be great. But anyway, yeah. Uh, yeah. Anywho, uh, Luna Seer is paying for the gift they got from Trappy Jenkins to Graxanoff. Thank you, Luna Seer. I really appreciate that. 
Yeah. Uh, PX Sharon. Howdy, howdy. Great to see you, PX. Hope you're doing well. Moonrise Rabbit. Uh, washing some dishes. I did a lot of that this weekend, Moonrise Rabbit. That's an essential chore. And, uh, yeah. You know? It, yeah, I, I don't know. I feel like I'm always washing dishes. Hmm. But yeah, need if you could take a gander at your leisure. Of course, Brennington. I've got it in notepad right there. We'll take a look at that when I'm done with uh, making my way through chat right now. And howdy, howdy, Claire Burr. Yeah. Oh, Darth Goof had a question. Darth Goof. Uh, where was that? Let's see. Oh, and wait, Blonde Bean says, I'm so happy a birthday dino stream. Is it, Blonde Bean, is it your birthday today? If so, happy, happy birthday to you, Blonde Bean. I wish you all the happiness in the world. Congratulations on another successful trip around Earth's sun. And uh, I hope this next trip is your best one yet. Thanks for being here, Blonde Bean. Yeah. Um, excellent. Whimsy, how are you doing? Welcome, welcome. And, uh... Let's see... Tactile says... How do we know we don't find... haven't had any purple dinosaurs. Tactile 3D picture. Well, we might, actually, already. It depends. Is... Is iridescent black purple in your book? Because there's a dinosaur... We call Microraptor that we think was kind of a purplish color. A kind of bluish, purplish, iridescent black. Something like that. Yeah. Almost kind of like a starling. You know. Um. Yeah. You know, something kind of like this, or maybe like that. Maybe kind of. Yeah. It depends. It depends. So yeah, we do have purple dinosaurs now, but like, uh... Like Lenina replied there, I believe, purple is a pretty rare color in nature. So yeah, hang on a minute. Some Somebody's having an episode outside. Let me go check on this. Keep an eye on the 3D printer while I do. Uh, never a dull moment in this neighborhood. But yeah, yeah. Uh, let's see here. Iacane is here. How are you doing? Welcome, welcome, Iacane Powda. Hope you had a great weekend. It's good to see you. I hope all is well. Yeah. Uh, Nafron, howdy, howdy. Great to see you. I feel like I missed a question from uh, from Darth Goof. Is Overaptor not a valid genus name anymore? We'll talk about that, Darth Goof. It is, but it's not as all-encompassing as it used to be. Yeah, it still gives its name to the whole group, Overaptoridae, Overaptorosauria. And Overaptor still is a valid genus, but it's a bit more specific than it used to be. We'll, we'll talk about that, I think. Especially now that Claire Burr is here. Claire Burr, it's great to see you. I hope you had a lovely week, and it's great to have you here in chat. Hope you're doing well, Claire. Yeah. All right, trying to catch up, trying to catch up, trying to get to the bottom of chat. Necromanty uh, says, can print errors usually be pre prevented if you baby it slash keep an eye on the thing? In this case, yes, Necromanty, because I let the spool of filament run out, and it was just going like that, just printing air because it ran out of filament. So, yeah, so we had to restart that one. That's, uh... Yeah, I gotta keep an eye on it here. Um, and is Belint here? Sci Ant Streams, how are you doing? How are you adjusting to uh, to fatherhood there, Sci Ant Streams? And how's Lita adjusting to mother? How are you both adjusting to parenthood? <laughs> it's great to see you, Belint. I hope uh, I hope you're doing really well. Hope uh, baby Alona is not giving you too much trouble. You know, babies could be a real handful, but. People say they're worth it, you know? 
Uh, and where would we be without babies? You know? Most people that I know were once babies. So, uh, gotta take care of them. Yeah. No, all joking aside, we're all really, really excited for you here in this community. And, um, hope baby, baby Ilona is doing really, really well. Uh, yeah, like I said, she's gonna be a scientist. I think so. Uh, but yeah, yeah. Let's see, Alcatraz sponsor says Michael C. How are you doing, Michael C.? Yeah, come stay at beautiful, sunny Alcatraz, you know? Uh, beautiful, sunny Alcatraz, you know? You can check in, but you can never leave? Is that how the phrase goes? Anyway, yeah. Um, I gotta catch up to chat. Sorry I'm being so uh, all over the place here. Lethgar, how are you doing? Welcome, welcome. It's great to see ya. Uh, Sacre Blue, what a world. How are you doing? Welcome, welcome to Paleontologizing. Yeah. Your random emote mirrors your Monday vibes. Sacre Blue, you did re redeem one emote there in chat? There you go. You're having cassowary vibes today, Sacre Blue. Sounds like, is that a good Monday? I don't know, to be a killer bird? <laughs> Take your dinosaur to the vet if it turns purple. That's a, that's usually good advice there, Necromancy, yes. And, uh... Brika Chu X2. Thank you very much. How are you doing, Brika Chu? Thank you for being here. Uh... radiate into new niches and how much can be attributed to luck? A case of being in the right place at the right time? It's uh, that's a hundred percent of it, Nader Fiend. Yeah, like it, it it all comes down to luck. Um I think if I'm understanding your question correctly, Nader Fiend, how much does biological design, which is an oxymoron, like there's no design in biology. There's no like top down force that dictates unless you consider like the history of the lineage to be that top down force. But yeah, which creatures rate it into new niches? That's a oh, that's an excellent question, Naderfiend. Holy cow! Um, this is why like creatures typically do better if environments are changing pretty slowly. Because if things are changing slowly, then the organisms in there can can generally adapt to that. But if things change too quickly, like we might talk about this today what caused earth's biggest mass extinction the permian mass extinction the one that kind of paved the way for the dinosaurs i do call myself an expert in dinosaur studies do you original old Happy dog to be a supporter of yours danny from one down to another thank you thank you original old dog for the six months of support really appreciate you thank you for helping me Avoid sudden extinction here on Twitch through your continued support. Yeah. We might talk about the Permian extinction today a little bit because that's always a topic ripe for discussion. But yeah, Naderfiend, that's an excellent question. And I... Naderfiend, can I ask you not... I'm not asking you for more bits. <laughs> Could you maybe rephrase your question? Think of a different way to phrase it because I'm not sure I fully understand what you're asking. And I might be talking past you right now, and I don't want to do that. Um, can you find a way to paraphrase it, Naderfiend? Because I'm not sure I understand what you're getting at. Um, yeah, and I know it's tough. Like, these are complex subjects. But yeah. Yeah, anyway. Um, scrolling through chat, scrolling through chat, trying to get down to the bottom. Oh, little one already watching you and learning. <laughs> I appreciate being part of little Ilona's screen time science streams. That means a lot. Um, yeah. 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 Let me... Can I say hello real quick? Um, hey, baby Ilona. I hope you're doing well. Thanks for being here. Hope you're behaving for, uh, for mom and dad there. Anyway. And if you're sleeping, I'll try not to wake you up. Uh, anywho. Yeah. <laughs> um, 
Yeah. And Bliss9 says, you can't recover the print if it runs out of filament. No, with a 3D printer like this, uh, my 3D printer will not even alert me if it runs out of filament. It doesn't... It has no way of sensing that it's run out of filament. It doesn't... It doesn't have that capacity. So, yeah. Alex Vixen is here. How you doing, Alex Vixen? Welcome, welcome. Great to see you. I hope all's well. And Lordy is here. Lordy, I hope... I hope you're taking care of yourself and taking care of Ios there, Lordy. Both... Ios and Lordy, two thirds of the Threes a Crowd stream team are down with some kind of bug right now. Um, they're not feeling well, so Lordy, I hope you and Ios are on the mend and you you take care of each other, okay? Yeah. Um, Captain Pugwash says my brother was once a baby. I remember it. See, Captain Pugwash has personal experience there. And uh, babies are kind of a big deal. Have you seen Boss Baby? Triceratops. I have not. I've had several bosses that I'm pretty sure were just giant babies in suits, but I've never seen that movie. Yeah. And Golgonex says, Flight Dynamics, ignorant question. Why did leg wings not, pardon the pun, take off? It's a great question, Golgonex. It might be because in dinosaurs... They couldn't really go out to the sides like arms can. Dinosaur legs are like, because of the structure of dinosaur hips, they're kind of stuck in the vertical like that. They couldn't really splay out to the side very much, from what I understand. Because dinosaur hips, um, yeah. Let's see. Dinosaur upright stance. Um... Yeah, that'll, that'll work. So, unlike modern reptiles that have kind of a sprawling gait, dinosaurs had erect limbs straight up and down. And see, the, the shape of their femur reflects that. Their thigh bone right there um, kind of comes out at an angle. It's like a 90-degree angle like this right there. See that? So, you can't really, like, do the splits or anything. Does that make sense? Um, so yeah, yeah, that might be part of it. So all those old illustrations that you see of, say, uh, Micro Raptor, yeah, kind of going like this, like doing the splits, they probably could not do that. It's probably more like this, you know? That's a much more realistic depiction, because their, their limbs just aren't built for, like, doing the splits like that, you know? Like this... Probably not actually possible. From what I understand. I could very well be wrong about that, but it's probably much more, you know, much more like that. So, yeah. Yeah. All right. Uh, trying to catch up to chat. Smorphosaurus, howdy, howdy. Great to have you here. Darian Beagle. Evolution is a contingent process, correct? Absolutely correct, Darian Beagle. Yes, indeed. Yeah. And, uh, let's see. Groovepunk says, if you could teleport yourself into what dinosaur era would you actually choose? Ooh, easy question, Groovepunk. Without a doubt, the dinosaur era that I would teleport into, provided I could teleport safely out, would be the Mesozoic era. A.K.A. the Age of Dinosaurs. Groovepunk, I appreciate your question. <laughs> but you kind of walked into that one. Here, let's take a look. This is what we call the International Chronostratigraphic Chart. Let's put it into linear time. Up here, the Cenozoic Era. That's from the meteorite strike 66 million years ago until the present. This is the Cenozoic Era. This is, today is at the very top. This is often called the Age of Mammals. Although you could also call it the age of birds, because birds outnumber mammal species two to one easily. The Mesozoic era is the age of dinosaurs. Dinosaurs first show up here in like probably the latest part of the Middle Cretaceous, or Middle Triassic, excuse me, Middle Triassic. About 240 million years ago, something like that. We probably had the first dinosaurs show up right about right about then. 
and then they go until the very end of the Cretaceous 66 million years ago. Notice how long this is, by the way. The Mesozoic, how much longer it is than than the Cenozoic, the Age of Mammals. It's, that's super short. Even just the Cretaceous period, right here, is longer than the entire Cenozoic era. So yeah. Anyway, you can see that distinction up here. We have super eons, eons, eras, periods, epochs, and ages. So the Mesozoic era is the age of the dinosaurs. So I'd pick that one if we're going by eras there. I uh, appreciate you, Group Funk. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, anyway, the bottom of chat, says Claire Burr in all caps. Not anymore. That's now the middle of chat, Claire Burr. Yeah. Um, and let's see. Brownabus has got you on his background entertainment while I do Homer. That's wonderful, Brownabus. Well, I hope you are very entertained. And I hope your homework's going well, Brownabus. Uh, and, uh, bottom of the ninth, bases are loaded. There you go, Brannington, yes. Uh, and, uh, yeah. You know, I've read that if you, if, if it is the bottom of the ninth and bases are loaded, and you hit a home run that's so big that it goes out of the stadium and then achieves low Earth orbit and then comes back around once, and that means that everybody on the bench also gets to get out and run the bases. Um, and they can do that for as long as the ball stays in orbit. And you can potentially, you know, if you're able to recruit to the team properly, you could get infinite runs. Um, and that would be the, the apocalyptic end of baseball as a sport. Not a lot of people know that. I just made that up. That is your hips don't lie. There you go, Sakura Blue. Yeah. Um, then it would become NASCAR. There you go, Clockwork Ninja. Yeah. <laughs> I'm looking at two chats at once. Trying to look at immediate chats and chats I'm catching up to. Um, yeah. Naderfiend says, I had in mind the, the rise of dinosaurs could be because they had an upright stance and an advanced metatarsal ankle. Dinosaurs were more agile and stable while running. That may have given dinosaurs a greater ability to capture food resources and a competitive edge over their competitors. And that they were endothermic. Or were they just lucky? Like Michael Benton of the University of Bristol argues. I mean... There were... The thing is, during the... The... You know, late Triassic period, there were a lot of contenders for who would be like... You know... The... Creatures that would occupy large-bodied terrestrial organism niches. And dinosaurs ended up winning out. In large part, it was because dinosaurs survived the mass extinction event at the end of the Triassic period. Right here. So, at the end of the Triassic, when a bunch of other critters died out, like the Rawasukians and, like, Cynodonts and all kinds of critters like that, Edosaurs and stuff, Dinosaurs survive, and yeah, is that due to luck? Is that due to some sort of inherent superiority? It feels silly even saying that. I don't know. Dinosaurs were really lucky to have those features in the first place, so that when things got tough, you know, they happened to survive. It it really does come down to luck at the end of the day, you know. As much as I'd love to say, oh, well, dinosaurs survive because. You know, because they're dinosaurs, and dinosaurs are awesome, you know? Um, well, shoot, then what would I say about the end of the Cretaceous period, when dinosaurs were wiped out by an asteroid, except for birds? Like, well, they got very unlucky. <laughs> because at the time, it did not pay to be a big, like a large-bodied terrestrial organism. Those were all the critters that got wiped out. It paid to be very small and... Be able to hide, you know, in burrows and eat seeds and crud. Like our ancestors, the mammals, you know? And like birds. Um, some birds, anyway, and some mammals. A bunch of mammals and a bunch of bird species also died out at that time. But 
universally, it's like large-bodied organisms were the ones that died out at the end of the Cretaceous. So yeah, ultimately, it comes down to luck, you know? Yeah. At the end of the day, yeah. Luck and not being overly specialized in certain cases, too. If we're talking about, like, at a species level, but if we're talking at, like, you know, larger, larger than a species level, then yeah. Yeah. Anyway. Uh, D. Maxwell, how are you doing? Mammals. Weak, lol. Yeah. And, uh, Nafron, I think I have a command for that, don't I? Um. Is it time? There you go. Yeah. Uh, thank you for sharing there. Uh, Claire it was, right? Thank you, thank you, Claire. Yeah. And please do not send me to the era with colossal arachnids and or insects, says Necromanty. That era is the Paleozoic. But it's like a particular period within the Paleozoic. Look, this is the Paleozoic right here. It's super long. Holy cow. Paleozoic goes from like 253 million years ago all the way to 541. There's like, shoot. There's like close to 300 million years right there of the Paleozoic. It's super long. The Carboniferous is the period you're thinking about with those gigantic arthropods there, Necromanty. So yeah, if you ever have access to a time machine, don't accidentally hit the Carboniferous button. <laughs> yeah. Um, you'd immediately get oxygen poisoning and faint. Yeah, the, it does seem like the atmosphere had a different composition back then. Yeah. Uh, Claire Burr says, you rock, Danny. No, you rock, Claire Burr. Thank you for everything you do. Um, yeah, back in the Triassic, lots of crocodiles are literally mimicking dinosaurs. Or were the dinosaurs mimicking those archosaurs there, Dr. Terra? They may have been first, to be honest, you know? Yeah. Um... Mayor Space says, that's over 9,000. <laughs> yeah. the It is true. Mayor Space, once again, is correct. The Paleozoic is over 9,000 years long. It's over 300 million years long. Or almost that. Anyway. Unimaginable amount of time, says Tommy Platicus. Well, you, you you get some practice with these things, and it's pretty, it's pretty imaginable. <laughs> Um, yeah, I don't know. I don't want to say these things become mundane. As, I don't know. As long as you, you work to cultivate that, that feeling of, uh, of wonder, you know, that we all get from paleontology, then it never becomes mundane. Uh, but yeah, yeah. Uh, where do the great pretenders come to scale those dimetrodons, Captain Pu Miss something? Did I mean that right? Yeah. And there you go, Helix Fossil. Oh, thank you, Helix Fossil. You flatter me. My goodness. Yeah. Um. But yeah, and it looks like I am pretty much down to the bottom of chat. Half a billion years sounds crazier than 500 million years, says Tommy Platicus. I know, right? Well, it's like saying a thousand millions sounds more impressive than a billion, right? Let me check on my 3D printer, too, because i got to keep doing this. And then we'll continue this this discussion of the scale of numbers and everything. Hang on. All right. Pretty soon I'm going to switch out that, uh, that filament spool. Um, but, yeah, a jillion bazillions. There you go, Mayor Space. Uh, oh, and Broken Power Lines says, what is the oldest piece of land on Earth? Holy cow, Broken Power Lines. Let's talk about that in a minute. But before we do... Um, for... Just to, to wrap everybody's minds around this idea of the difference between a million and a billion... They are very, very different. We all know that a billion is more than a million. 
And maybe that's the most we ever really think about it on a daily basis, you know? Everybody's busy, you know, everybody's working jobs, they... You probably have not really sat down and tried to, like, for lack of a better term, meditate on the idea of the difference between a million and a billion. So let's talk about that for a minute. Let's talk about it in terms of time, I guess. You know, if you have a watch or like an analog clock on the wall or a digital clock with seconds, you know, you can become really familiar with how long a second is. One Mississippi, two Mississippi. Well, like we used to count in uh, in PE class in school. One Allosaurus, two Allosaurus, three Allosaurus. You know. Everybody's familiar with a second. Think about how long a million seconds would be. You know, if we look it up, a million seconds would take up 11 days, 13 hours, 46 minutes, 40 seconds. So a million seconds is 11 and a half days. 11 and a half days is a long time to wait, you know? That's a million seconds right there. Okay, that's a million. Long time. 11 and a half days. What do you think a billion seconds is? Just, you know that it's larger than a million. But how much larger? One billion seconds is 31.69 years. 31 and a half years. A million seconds is 11 and a half days. Let's say 12. 12 days. A million seconds is 12 days. Let's round up. A billion seconds is 31 years. You're not doing so badly yourself for a paleontologist. Well, thank you, Anthem Ono, for the kind words, and thank you for the follow. Welcome to Paleontologizing. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. A gigasecond is 32 years exactly, Golganak. Isn't that crazy? A thousand times more. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. Given that's the case, uh, let's talk about what is the oldest piece of land on Earth. Thank you, Broken Power Lines, for your excellent question there. You know, I remember talking about this with my... Uh... One of my sedimentary geology professors in college. Um, yeah. What is the oldest rock in the world? And let's take a look at this real quick. Here is a lovely video from Psy Show. I, I feel like we've watched this before, but... It'll be worth a rewatch, I think. These are usually pretty good. Uh, take a look. Somehow yeah. the Earth has already celebrated its 4.5 billionth birthday. And when you're considering yeah. that big of a time scale, it makes you realize that humans have only been around for the proverbial blink of an eye. There's no way we could know everything that's happened in our planet's history because we weren't around for most of it. But thanks to geology, we don't need a time machine to explore how our planet was born. Instead, yep. we can study the oldest rocks and minerals, ones that have been around 14,000 times longer than our oldest human ancestor. These samples have... And by the way... It might be maybe a good thing that we don't have a time machine to study this because I forget which science fiction author was writing about this, but they introduced the idea that, you know, the concept of a time machine, like, uh, let's see. Uh... Yeah. <laughs> um, there's a potential hazard here. Hmm. <laughs> In 
And by the way, we're getting further descending down some rabbit holes here. But do doesn't that guy's voice sound familiar? Who's that guy? He did like a bunch of the voiceovers for like rides at Disneyland and stuff like that. I want to say it's the same guy's voice. Um, like I think he did like the from the Haunted Mansion uh, song and stuff like that. Isn't that? Is it the same guy? Am I crazy? Paul, is it Paul Freeze? I bet you it is, XF Kirsten. I bet you it is. Yeah. <laughs> and don't go too far down the rabbit hole. You'll find Morlocks. There you go, Hojo Cat. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> well, you know, ultimately, that's where the paleontologists belong, you know? We're not we're not the Eloi. We are the, the Morlocks digging down into the earth. Um Shoot, we don't get paid enough to be Eloy, you know? Anyway. Uh... There we go. The time machine. Let's show the machine. I want to see the machine. I feel like I've seen this before. And hang on a minute. What's that guy's name? He was in The Birds, too. He was in that movie with The Birds. Um, but yeah, yeah. Don LaFontaine did a lot of the trailer narrations. Interesting, Alan Jackson. Okay. What's this guy's name? Yeah, The Birds. You know that movie I'm talking about, the one with the birds in it? What was it called? The Alfred Hitchcock movie. The one with the birds. What was it called? And who is this guy? Not Angry Birds 2. Uh, Rod Taylor. Oh, okay. Rod Taylor, not Birdemic, Mayor of Space. <laughs> no. <laughs> uh, uh, the Birds. No, I, I know Paper Cuts, but what was the name of the film? The one that had the birds in it, you know? Um, Yeah, yeah. Anyway. Who's on first, Urgil Hudger Cat? I... Yes. <laughs> anyway, um, yeah. From what I've heard, uh, there's an idea that I found really interesting that I heard once about, you know, something to watch out for if you actually had a real life. If such a device were actually possible, if you could actually have a real-life time machine that travels through time, you would also have to make sure that it can travel through space. Because let's think about it. You know... The Earth itself is not stationary. It moves. It orbits the sun. And the sun, in turn, has an orbit. You know, it goes around in the galaxy, and the galaxy itself is moving also. So if you had a time machine that only traveled through time and not also through space, then if you were to, say, travel back 66 million years ago to watch the asteroid, you know, hit the Earth and cause the end of the age of dinosaurs, well, shoot. If you're in one place, just traveling back 66 million years ago, you'd end up in the middle of outer space. <laughs> like, light years from nowhere. Because <laughs> you're not traveling along with the Earth, you know, as it's moving around. So, uh, yeah, Bliss 9th, I'm sorry you had to throw away your time machine plans there. But, you know, I probably saved you a lot of drifting endlessly through space, Bliss 9. So... There you go. Yeah. The ponderous Trachodon, 32 feet long and Ola Loka, thank you for the follow. Welcome to Paleontologizing. How are you doing? It's good to have you here. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. Uh. And Simmermom, I have seen this Simmermom, the T-Rex autopsy film. Yes, indeed. They recreated the T-Rex. I've seen it. It's, it's good stuff. I'm... It's not my favorite because I, myself, here, 
Confession time. Um, chat, between you and me, I, I don't do very well in dissections. I'm, I'm not very good at that kind of thing, because I get kind of squeamish. So, I didn't have the most fun watching T-Rex Autopsy. But it is a really, really cool documentary. And it, it there's a number of paleontologists in it. I, I want to say that... Um, uh, who... There's a few UK paleontologists in it, I think. Uh, I'm blanking right now on who it is. But it's good stuff. You should check it out. And it is on Disney Plus now. So if you have that, check it out, everybody. Um, it's it's some fun stuff. It really is. Yeah, Scrooge people high five. Yeah, Kirsten. Yeah. Um, I, I, it wasn't Darren Nash, Tommy Platicus. I don't think so. Here, another rabbit hole. Before we get to the, we will we will talk about the oldest rock on Earth in a minute. But you know, this is a live broadcast. We've got people coming into chat. You can never predict what's gonna happen here. So. Uh, T-Rex autopsy trailer. Um, there we go. Have a look-see. Sixty-seven thousand and seven years. Sixty-seven million and seven million years ago, something died. <laughs> uh, world first T-Rex autopsy. Ah, <laughs> oh, the drama. Uh. Do we have an actual trailer? Yeah, let's try that. Experts are about to embark on a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity. Sorry, too loud. To dissect a dinosaur. What a wonderful opportunity to understand T-Rex as an animal. Specialists have rebuilt a life-sized, anatomically correct T-Rex. So yeah. Dissected. This should do the trick. Whoa. If there, there we go. I didn't think it was Steve Brusati, but it is Steve. Excuse me, Steve Brusati. So it can be accurately dissected. This should do the, the trick. Whoa. So who is an American paleontologist? He's up in Scotland right now in Edinburgh. But uh, you don't think a chainsaw is the proper instrument for this procedure? Mayor Space, there is here. This will introduce us to. This is a nice segue to another series called Inside Nature's Giants, and uh, we'll get to that in a second. If we know how it died, we can work out how it lived. T-Rex autopsy. And for once, holy cow, I mean... Why am I happy about this? Does anybody know? Take a guess. What about this would make me happy? They got it right, Jody Fish? Yes, indeed! Yes. For once. You know, a, a media outfit actually got T-Rex's name right. It's not T-Rex. It's T dot... There should be a space there, Rex, and it should be italicized. But... Anyway, uh, this is enough to make me really happy. There's a dot instead of a dash, you know? Instead of T slash Rex. <laughs> I've never seen T slash Rex, Dr. Javasaurus. That's funny. But yeah, yeah. So Tyrannosaurus Rex, the name... T-Rex, that, that name is a... um, It's an abbreviation. 
you know? It's like saying E. coli. Everybody knows E. coli, right? Yeah, E. coli. Bacteria, but even that is wrong. Like, from live science, E. coli with a capital C? Uh-uh. Um, yeah. We're talking about here is the Latin binomial, binomial nomenclature. So there you go, yeah, that's a good example. Carcardon carcarius, the white shark. Yeah. So you have the genus name and the species name. Uh, so the generic name is always capitalized, always italicized, describes the genus. The species name, never capitalized, always italicized, describes the species. If you want to abbreviate it, you do C dot carcarius for carcardon carcarius. E. coli, the bacteria, is an abbreviation for Escherichia coli. I think that's how you say it. Anyway, I'm not a bacteriologist, if you didn't notice. <laughs> um, H. sapiens, homo sapiens, and etc. You know? So, yeah. And are humans homo sapiens sapiens? There's an extra, like, subspecies put on the end there, Ash Girl. Yeah. So, like, sometimes you have subspecies at the end. We usually leave those off, but sometimes they get appended. Yeah. I, Carly, there you go. Yeah. Yeah. For, um, Irritator Carly. Gertis Pucka, yes, indeed. Yeah. So yeah, M. musculus. Yeah, that's the mouse, Dr. Javasaurus. Yeah. Um, M. musculus is a little mousy boy. Yeah. The house mouse. Um, So-called because... Does anybody know why it's called the house mouse? Because they love house music. Uh, yeah, like Dead Mouse. And, uh, the common European vampire. There you go, PX Sharon. <laughs> H. Sapien Sanguinis. Interesting. Because they build houses, says Mayor Space. Yeah. Um, they love medical drama, says Maxim Darnish. Yes. Uh, mice really love medical dramas with Eugene Lowry. Um. <laughs> oh goodness. Yeah. Or R uh Norvegicus. There you go. Yeah. R Norvegicus, I think is the the Norway rat, right? Yeah, there you go. Ratus Norvegicus. So the thing is any critter that has a scientific name which is all critters that have ever been scientifically described. Like, you name an animal or a plant or a fungus or a protist, and you can abbreviate its name. This is R. Norvegicus. Um, this is B. rex right here. Balaniceps rex, the shoebill. You could call it B. rex because Balaniceps rex is its genus and species name. Balaniceps rex. And you would abbreviate that B dot space rex. And the whole thing would be italicized. So, yeah. Wasn't it Hugh Laurie? Oh, yeah, shoot. Eugene Laurie was the one who... Who, uh... Yeah. He was... Eugene Laurie, um... Uh... Reptilicus? What am I thinking? Um, the Great Behemoth? No. I'm all confused. I'm getting my people's names mixed up. Yeah. Uh, but anyway. Yeah. And there you go, Jody Fish. Yes. Yes, indeed. And... Of Troodon. Very nice. 
Othvale, thank you for the follow. Welcome to Paleontologizing. Not Eugene Levy, Maxim Darnage. Shoot, who di who directed um uh who directed uh Gorgo Gorgo film Eugene Larry There we go. That's who I was thinking of. And now, shoot, I gotta show you the trailer for this, too. We're going further down some rabbit holes, but we will emerge. I guarantee you. Um. Yeah. There we go. No motion picture of our time has ever unleashed shock spectacle of... <laughs> Gorgo! Kind of a British knockoff of Godzilla? Yeah. Waiting for Gorgo. There you go, Ben Medler, yes. Uh, waiting for Gorgo. I can't go let him go bust and see where he belongs. Why? Maybe to save their silly skins for you. Yeah, that kid knows what's up. The headlines do not record the story of a little boy who had a curious sympathy and understanding for the fantastic creature. Yeah. secret does he know? It's a different time in the 60s, Ash Girl, yeah. You trying to say there may be a fully grown one of these things around somewhere? How big would a full grown one be? An approximate guess. The infant. <laughs> We've watched this before. Shoot. Who can tell me what this dinosaur actually is right here? That's a real illustration from a paleontologist. Which dinosaur is that actually? Anybody have a guess? It did. It, it does. It's got a broken tail. It isn't a. It is a kind of iguanodontian. Claire Burr, yes. Um, I have a hand of it right here. There we go. Yeah. Dr. Terra got it right. Ah, oh, shoot. Um, that is... Camptosaurus. Camptosaurus. Sing this song. Duda, duda. Camptosaurus. Yeah. Uh, I think one of the most underappreciated of all dinosaurs is Camptosaurus. If you've ever been to the Los Angeles County Museum, or the Los Angeles Museum of Natural History, I guess as they call it now, then you've seen this dinosaur, Camptosaurus. Presumably. It's not, it's not the biggest dinosaur, you know? It's not the most overtly charismatic doesn't necessarily have the biggest horns or frills or teeth or spikes or plates or sails or anything, really. But it's a really important dinosaur because this, this dinosaur, Camptosaurus, was, uh, was a harbinger of things to come. As an early Iguanodontian dinosaur, this critter is like a prototype for dinosaurs that would later take over the Earth. Camptosaurus, um, really cool animal, yeah, and, uh, LACM, here is that old mount at Los Angeles County Museum, here's an Allosaurus menacing a poor Camptosaurus, and this is what the Camptosaurus looks like now, it, its head is a little small, honestly, makes me wonder if that's actually proportioned correctly, but you'll notice those hands there, are the same as those right here. Camptosaurus hand. Yeah. We've got, uh... This is the... Right hand right here. Thumb, forefinger, middle finger, ring finger, pinky finger. Right there. Camptosaurus. 
It's a far cry from our Iguanodon, who's got a much larger hand, which we're currently 3D printing. Check on that again. So far, so good. Printing the thumb spike on our Iguanodon hand. But, uh, yeah. This is going to go on right here. Like this. I think by the end of the week, we'll have this done. And I'm excited about it. Full size Iguanodon hand 3D print. Very excited. And we don't have any evidence for a fuzzy tail, Dr. Javasaurus. That's a good question about Camptosaurus. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh. Yeah, and Camptosaurus is in a movie, so there's that. Yep, Camptosaurus. Legit movie star. Camptosaurus. Yeah. I really like this Camptosaurus illustration here. They may have had fuzz. I, I don't know. We don't we don't have good evidence either way right now. Other dinosaurs that are related to it, like Kulindodromia, certainly had fuzz. But yeah. Yeah. And Hojo Cat, how you doing? Yeah. Duda Duda indeed, Hojo Cat. Yeah. So yeah. Yeah. Back to the oldest rocks on earth? No, back to back to Gorgo. Waiting for Gorgo. The infant. The adult. <laughs> <laughs> hey, Gorgo, where? How you doing? Welcome, welcome. Yeah. Captured its offspring, towering over the cities of the world as millions flee its awesome terror. There you go, Naki Row. Yeah. Vincent Gorgo, yeah, Maximum Darnage. Oh, bye bye, Big Ben. Bye, missile guys. Nothing can stop it. Defying the force of the army. The might of the Navy. <laughs> I had to take some clips from this and make, a, make some alerts. Uh. Ready to open fire, sir. File one. Ooh, Gato class submarine. The fury of the jets. In a crashing crescendo of sights never before beheld by human eyes and adventures never before experienced by any man or woman. Uh. Shockingly convincing. <laughs> oh, oh, there's so many possible possible alerts in there. Shoot, let me make a note. This is uh, this is good stuff. It's good stuff indeed. Uh, uh. Yeah, here we go. Make alerts. There we go. Anywho, yeah. Uh, that is deterministic science. There you go, Dr. Dumpster. Yeah, complete isometry there. No no allometric growth. Totally isometric. <laughs> uh, but yeah. And I agree. Gorgo does seem like a very solid dude, Triceratops. Yes, indeed. Dude or dudette or whoever. Yeah. Um... And I, Maxim Darnish, that's exactly what I was thinking for the alerts. Yeah. You can see why the house mice like his work, Clockwork Ninja. Yeah, there you go. Yeah. Anyway, where were we? We'd seen the Fury of Gorgo like nothing we've ever seen before. T Rex Autopsy, we looked at that. We were talking about the time machine. Uh. Yeah. Now let's get back to the oldest rocks on Earth, shall we? Let's do it. ...to explore how our planet was born. Instead, we can study the oldest rocks and minerals, ones that have uh, been around 14,000... Me too, Trappy, yeah. Good stuff. Human ancestor. ...these samples have already shaken up what we Gorga. found about the Earth's history. <laughs> and the very ups. oldest rocks on Earth can even teach us about the birth of the solar system itself. We found... And actually, Gorga... So Triceratops says Gorga is the female of the species, I'd imagine. But... We'll see if there's even a trailer for this. There's another film. Yes. Oh. With oh, wait until you see this chat. Holy cow. The most realistic, convincing, mind-bogglingly 
authentic depiction of a dinosaur anywhere ever in a, uh, a theatrical trailer or indeed a film, check it out. Uh. Watch out for mother. Mark, let's get out of here. <laughs> 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 oh boy. Yeah. Look at that authenticity. Just absolutely convincing. It's like you're right there in the Cretaceous period. You know? Wow. Oh, don't do that. You jerk. I hope it eats you. Anyway. Yeah. Uh... And how do they manage to make it look so real and it's aged so I know, right, Lenina? Just incredible. Incredible stuff. Really exquisite. And grab that one for alerts too. <laughs> uh But yeah, yeah. Anyway, back to How old are the oldest rocks on Earth? Colin Trevorrow, eat your heart out. Exactly, Tracer it up. Almost as bad as Jurassic World. Yeah. <laughs> Somehow the Earth there you go, Tommy Platicus. Yeah. It's 4.5 billion yeah. birthday. And when you're considering that big... Oh, and hang on. Bef hang on just, just a second, dude. We had one more question that I want to get back to before we continue. And uh, somebody had a question about... Uh oh, uh Jay Munozar says the one with the claw and it is from Iguanodon family, but what is the specific name for it? It's Iguanodon, yeah. Iguanodontia is the name of the whole group. But this is the forelimb of an iguanodon, which it needs the this part the carpal in the thumb spike. I'm printing that right now. But anyway, this is part of Iguanodon proper. Iguanodon was one of the, it was the first of the Iguanodontians to be found, and so it gave its name to the whole group. Iguanodontia is named after Iguanodon. Does that make sense? So yeah. Yeah. And, uh, yeah. Somebody had a question about if I were to go back in time. Where was that? Um... Let's see. Uh, a Nader Fiend has requested a dinosaur deep dive. We'll do that after this video, Nader Fiend. Thank you, thank you. Yeah. Well, shoot. Somebody had a question about if I were to, to somehow have a window back in time and look at real authentic dinosaurs as they actually lived. Would they look just like our modern depictions of dinosaurs? We're not there yet. There would be a lot of surprises. For certain. Yeah. I suspect there'd be a lot more feathers than we currently think dinosaurs had. It, if indeed feathers are basal to Ornithodira. If dinosaurs and pterosaurs both got their, their feathery coverings from the same common ancestor, then that would imply that all dinosaurs ancestrally had feathers. And, uh... Yeah, I think we would be surprised at the featheriness. E even if the feathers looked primitive and filamentous like hairs, we would be surprised by how many dinosaurs had feathers. And I think we'd also be surprised by the amount of, like, weird keratinous stuff that didn't fossilize and weird soft tissue structures used for display on different dinosaurs, I think we'd be very surprised. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. There'd be more types of feathers as well. I agree, Dr. Devasaurus. There probably were. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and a feathered apatosaurus? I've seen that before, Jody Fish. Other artists have uh, have used that 
idea. Uh, yeah, like a feathery Camarasaurus. I'm trying to find some... Uh, where is that? There was a feathered Camarasaurus and Dryasaurus in the same picture. Uh, remember when I first saw this when I was a kid, it blew my mind. There's a feathery Dryasaurus there. A little ornithopod dinosaur. A little beaky plant eater. From the Morrison Formation, late Jurassic of North America. But I'm trying to find this particular one. Uh, cause it, man, it really, it really put the hook in me as a kid. I'm like, wow, what if ornithopods had feathers too? What if it's not just a theropod thing? And then we had coolindodromias that shows that, hey, at least some ornithopods did have feathers. But it's not showing up at the moment. I wonder if I search, uh, DuckDuckGo if it'll come up. Uh... Feathered Dryasaurus images. Let's see. There's a feathery Dryasaurus. They're not the same one I was looking for. There's Greg Paul's feathery Dryasaurus. There's another instance of it there. Greg Paul's art gets stolen all the time. I don't know what it is about paleo fans online, but they love stealing Greg Paul's art. Um, yeah. I don't know if it's going to come up here. But anyway, feathered sauropods. It's an idea that people have had before there. Um, Jody Fish, so yeah. yeah. Anyway, let's return now to this discussion of uh, what are the oldest rocks on our venerable planet Earth. Shoot. Let's take a look at it. Yeah. And uh, Brika Chu says, if you look at a bunny skeleton, you would never think it would be as cute as it is. I think a lot of dinosaurs would be a lot cuter than we currently think they would be. So I agree with you, Brika Chu. Yes, yes. Let's watch this. Somehow the Earth has already celebrated its 4.5 billionth birthday. And when you're considering mm. that big of a time scale, it makes you realize that humans have only been around for the proverbial blink of an eye. There's no way yeah. we know everything We're that's new. happened in our planet's history because we weren't around for most of it. But thanks to geology, we don't need a time machine to explore how our planet was born. Instead, we can study the... That's why I went off on that tangent. Yeah, if we did take a time machine, got to make sure it travels through space as well, so we're not like... Traveling through time, but not through space. We just end up in the endless vacuum of space because the Earth moves, you know? Anyway. The oldest rocks and minerals, ones that have been around 14,000 times longer than our oldest human ancestor. These yeah. samples have already shaken up what we thought we knew about the Earth's history. And the yeah. oldest rocks on Earth can even teach us about the birth of the solar system itself. We found hmm. all kinds of old minerals and rocks, but in 2014, scientists confirmed that zircon crystals found in Western Australia took home the record. Based on how certain atoms within the crystals had decayed, researchers pegged them at 4.4 billion years old. 4.4 billion years old for the oldest rocks on Earth that we've found thus far. 4.4 billion. That predates the origin of life by like maybe close to a billion years. A billion is a thousand millions. And a million, I'll remind you, chat, is a million ones. A billion is a billion ones. That's that's a lot of ones, you know? Um, That's a big number, you know? It reminds me of this. Uh, you know, I, I once saw this in a textbook, and... Yeah. You know, it really... That's just 40 right there, you know? Imagine a billion. Imagine if Lex Luthor stole a billion cakes. Um, cause he, right now he took forty cakes. That's as many as four tens, and that's terrible. Think about a billion cakes. You know, that's as many as a thousand millions, and a million is a thousand thousands. 
and a thousand is ten one hundreds, and one hundred is ten tens. So that's that's a lot, you know? Yeah. Anywho. Um, so many tens. I know four tens here, but imagine that for a billion. It would be it'd be incredible. That means they formed less than 200 million years after the Earth did. These crystals grow in magma, molten or semi-molten rock that bubbles beneath the Earth's surface <laughs> and are made of silicon, <laughs> oxygen, and zirconium. The Australian zircon crystals were actually no bigger than a household dust mite, just 400 micrometers in length. At first glance, they don't seem like much, but these minuscule crystals are almost indestructible, are resistant yeah. to erosion, and are capable of outliving the rock in which they were formed. They just kept washing in and out of sedimentary rocks over billions of years until they were found by intrepid geologists. But discovering them was about more than setting records. Knowing when, where, and how they formed tells us how the Earth came to be the Earth. They might also debunk some big ideas we had about our planet's baby days. See, we previously hmm. thought that during Earth's first 600 million years or so, our planet was all fire and brimstone. We believed it was constantly bombarded with meteors and covered in a planet-wide ocean of lava. Appropriately, that time is called the Hadean Eon, like Hadean. Laertes says if Lex stole 1 billion pies, he'd get caused, caught because there'd be nowhere to hide at all? I don't know, Laertes. He might, uh, if he were somehow able to steal a billion pies, it's like he might then be the pie king, you know? It's like that old that old saying that, like, if you owe the bank a $1,000, you're in trouble. Um, But if you owe the bank a billion dollars, the bank is in trouble, you know? I think the bakery would be in a lot of trouble if Lex Luthor stole a billion pies, Layer T. Um, that, you know, sometimes the magnitude of the crime, like, makes it okay in our society. And I'm not going to go into detail about that because, <laughs> oh boy, is that a discussion for another day? But um, scary indeed, Claire Burr. Yeah. If you owe the bank a billion dollars, that's the bank's problem. Like, they're, oh boy, they're in trouble. So anyway, yeah. Uh, here we go. And it's when those old... They might also debunk some big ideas we had about our planet's baby days. See, we previously thought that during Earth's first 600 million years or so, our planet was all fire and brimstone. We believed it was constantly bombarded with meteors and covered in a planet-wide ocean of lava. Appropriately, that time is called the Hadean Eon, like Hades. Mm. And yeah. it's when those oldest zircon crystals form. Unsurprisingly, constant meteor impacts and lava oceans aren't the best recipe for any Earth rocks or minerals to stick around. So finding these 4.4 billion year old zircons shook up our story a little bit. It made scientists <laughs> realize that the Hadean Eon might have been less fiery than we originally thought. Because like, zircon really? crystals are really strong, but they still shouldn't have been able to survive those conditions. And that's not- Yeah, you know, uh, they're like, um, you know, think of zircon crystals like, like, uh, like Wayne the Rock Johnson, you know? Where Wayne the Rock Johnson might be really strong, but he probably couldn't survive being submerged in magma. Uh, or lava, for that matter. You know? Zircons are kind of the same way. You know? Um, no, Jody... My name is Danny, not Dwayne. Jody Fish. What? the only reason the zircons were significant. The researchers also examined what's known as the oxygen isotope composition of the crystals, or the ratio of heavier versus lighter <laughs> oxygen atoms. This can help them infer what the temperatures were like when the crystals uh. were formed. Surprisingly, the zircons composition actually matched rocks from a later time period, called the Archean Eon, when the Earth was cool enough to have oceans and continents. Together, this suggests that the Earth had actually cooled down enough by 4.4 billion years ago <laughs> to form a solid crust. That's 600 million years earlier than we used to think. The crystals are also a huge point in favor of what's known as the cool early Earth hypothesis. This suggests that temperatures on Earth between 4.4 and 4 billion years ago were actually low enough to sustain liquid water oceans. So hmm. not really like Hades at all. Still, these... Okay, that's interesting. That's interesting. So early Earth may have been a little bit more hospitable than we than we once thought. Yeah. Um, how, how you doing, Paddle and Michael C? Yeah. Uh, you smell what the rock is cooking in magma, the raptor, yes. Um, yeah, early oceans means early life, says Clockwork Ninja, and 
That's an interesting point there. Earth yes, indeed. Hypothesis. This suggests yeah. that temperatures on Earth between 4.4 and 4 billion years ago were actually low enough to sustain liquid water oceans. So hmm. not really like Hades at all. Still, these zircons are the only clues we have about this part of Earth's history. And we'll need to do more research to be certain. Nothing's for sure yet. So far, the zircon crystals are the oldest pieces of Earth we've ever found. And hmm. they can teach us a lot. But funnily enough, there are even older rocks on Hang on. Not to be all, you know, uh, prescriptivist Peter about this kind of thing, prescriptivist Paul, but is funnily actually a word? Can you take funny and make it an adverb like that? I wonder about this. Is funnily a word? Funnily, in a strange or amusing way. Uh, and from the Grammar Phobia blog, is it cringeworthy? Follow-up question, is the word cringeworthy worthy of cringing at? Anyway, yeah. Uh, anyway, I, it's legit though, you know? I might not like it, but it is legit, you know? Yeah. Ironically, no, says Triceratops. Isn't funny already an adverb, says Hojo Cat? An adverb is a word that can describe an adjective uh, or a verb. So it probably is. Yeah. Funny you should ask, says Ash Girl. Yeah. Uh, and it is in the OED. Really? The Oxford Extended Dictionary Verse, Golganek. Interesting stuff. Yeah. And it can also modify another adverb. So, yeah. Theoretically, you could just have a string of adverbs that extends into infinity, you know? Yeah. Hey, let's let's get back to our video. We'll give this guy we'll give this by we'll give this guy a pass, you know? of earth we've ever found and they can teach us a lot but funnily enough there are even older rocks on boringly our planet. they just didn't start out here the oldest pieces of our planet are zircon crystals but the oldest rocks on earth were brought here from the moon or deposited by meteorites and those can teach us about the whole solar system in 1969 a two metric ton meteor hit the atmosphere above allende mexico fragments Ooh. of the meteorite are dated to 4.57 billion years ago nearly 200 million years older than australia's zircon crystals and old Older than almost anything else in our solar system. Among other wow. things, some scientists have used the fragments to try and confirm the order in which elements condensed when the solar system was just getting started. Conveniently, around the same time, astronauts also began bringing back samples of lunar rocks. In 1971, huh. Apollo 14 brought back some of the oldest moon rocks, yeah. they were determined to be 4.51 billion years old. The Holy age cow, of that's samples, old. Much like Australia's zircon crystals, help scientists infer that our moon formed within the first 60 million years after the birth of the solar system. They also Show Which that is moon had a magma ocean of its own. really interesting, and it's it's interesting that we would have rocks that old on the moon's surface. But it makes a lot of sense when you realize when you realize that the the moon doesn't really have a lot of like geologic processes. The moon doesn't really have like a rock cycle like we have here on our own planet Earth. You know, we don't have. This kind of deal going on on the moon. Where you've got, you know, today. Uh, igneous rock, which has brought up, you know, cooled magma. And then it's eroded by, you know, uh, wind and rain and stuff like that. And then it turns into sedimentary rock. And then it gets metamorphosed and then it melts and then it becomes magma again. There's no process like this on the moon, to my knowledge. The moon is pretty dead, geologically speaking. You know? It has ceased to be. The moon is cold. There you go, Jody Fish. Yeah, there you go. Uh, so, yeah. Yeah. A triceratops says adverbs are tough. No, adverbs are toughly and resiliently. And, um... Uh, yeah. 
Anyway, I appreciate you, Triceratops. Yeah. It is an X parrot. It's an X moon. You know? I mean, it's still there. But yeah. He must make some mac and cheese. Did our talking about the moon make you crave cheese, Golgonek? Have you been watching too much Wallace and Gromit? Yeah. And Travel says, Link, please. You would like a link to the uh, the rock cycle? Shoot, I can find you a link. Um, the rock cycle. Yeah. Copy image address. And paint. Uh, paint. Pop paste. I'm getting... Uh, not verbing correctly, everybody. Yeah. Yeah. Adjective... Adverbs are tough. Tough is adjective. Adjective is noun. This is I know, it's... Who came up with this crazy language? Anyway. Let's finish out this video, shall we? And that it cooled into a lunar crust before Earth's did. So far, we don't have that much insight into how the solar system or the Earth formed, or into why we're lucky enough that our planet can support life. Trying to piece together events that happened more than four billion years ago can, for obvious reasons. <laughs> Jody Fish says, no, tough is a light porous rock formed by consolidation of volcanic ash. That is true. Tough is an it is a highly it's not mafic, it's M Mafic means that it's dark colored. It is a um. What's the word for light colored? Why is this slipping my mind right now? Oh, I'm a terrible felsic. Thank you, Jody Fish. Thank you, thank you. It is felsic, just like andesite. Yeah. People are wondering what the heck I'm talking about. Um. Yeah. Here we go. That's tough right there. Thomas Farley of SouthwestRockCounty.com. Wanted to go over tough again. Tough is the product or the result of... That's T-U-F-F, -F, tough. And rock fragments called class that are thrown out of a vent. And of course, you'll see tough anywhere that volcanoes were present. Yep. They don't have to be black class or rock fragments. Tough. T U F F, Claire Burr. Yeah. And there's all sorts of densities to, to tough. Let's see if we can get that closer. In that, you. There's a cat. This is the hardest <laughs> form. This is Hello, cat. Truly an incredibly hard rock. Not sure I can really represent how hard that is, but this is called <laughs> densely welded tough. And you compare that to something like this, which is called slightly uh, liquefied, slightly made into a rock. This is ashy, truly ashy, even if it doesn't look, look like good. hard biscuits, says Pikachu. I mean, they kind of are. Biscuits are made out of flour and water. Maybe some baking powder or something like that. Tough is can also have rock that's made out of that you might find. yeah. This is a pyroclastic tough ball. Yeah. Uh, looking like a concretion. Holy cow! But you can see the class or rock fragments inside. And the Mohs hardness scale. Tough would be very, despite its name, t tough, tough, tough is not tough. Uh, like, tough, T-U-F-F, -F, is very low on the Mohs hardness scale. Like, you can scratch it with your fingernails and stuff. This cat could scratch it apart, you know? Um, I think it's pretty low. I think it's pretty low. And the cat is interested in this subject, as as we all are, Hojo Cat. You're right. And then you yeah. might have... And Ash Girl says, F, Caddis. You're right, Ash Girl. You are correct. That is F, Caddis, right there. And that's a callback, uh, Ash Girl. Yes, indeed. F. Catus, Felis Catus, the domestic cat. Ash Girl's paying attention. Yeah. Uh, studies at Tufts University. Very funny, Bliss Nine. So many classes. Oh, boy. That you have a oh, 
Hang on. We've got a weird noise there. We've still got filament in the printer. Let me see what, where our spool is at. Hang on a second. Oh, boy. Oh, 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 boy. It is time. It is time to change out this spool. Because we are running out of filament. We've got, like, maybe 15 minutes left of filament there. So I'm going to change this out real quick. You hang tight, chat. And, um... Here, let's let SciShow do their thing. And, uh, and I will be right back, okay? Here we go. The meteor hit the atmosphere above Allende, Mexico. Fragments of the meteorite are dated to 4.57 billion years ago, nearly 200 million years older than Australia's zircon crystals, and older than almost anything else in our solar system. Among other things, some scientists have used the fragments to try and confirm the order in which elements condensed when the solar system was just getting started. Conveniently, around the same time, astronauts also began bringing back samples of lunar rocks. In 1971, Apollo 14 brought back some of the oldest moon rocks, later determined to be four. 4.51 billion years old. And the age of these samples, much like Australia's zircon crystals, help scientists infer that our moon formed within the first 60 million years after the birth of the solar system. They also show that our moon had a magma ocean of its own, and that it cooled into a lunar crust before Earth's did. So far, we don't have that much insight into how the solar system or the Earth formed, or into why we're lucky enough that our planet can support life. Trying to piece together events that happened more than 4 billion years ago can, for obvious reasons, be tricky. But between the zircon crystals, meteorites, and moon rocks, we have plenty of time capsules to give us a good start. And as we keep discovering older samples, we'll just keep learning even more. So, great news. The SciShow website, scishow.com, is completely updated. We now have an up-to-date about page with all of our team, a page detailing each of the four SciShow channels, plus links to our Patreon and our DFTBA merch store. It's easy to navigate, and it looks even better than- Anyway, sorry for all those self-promo stuff. But this is- Yeah, it's going now. Excellent. We've got a new spool on there. This print will not be lost, absent some kind of catastrophic failure. Um, very nice, very nice. And uh, cool, thank you to this guy for uh, telling us about the oldest rocks on our venerable planet Earth. But uh, yeah, yeah, anywho. 3D printing is going beautifully. We've got one piece left to print for our Iguanodon hand life size 3D print. That thumb spike is going to go on right here. I'm going to stick up like that. And then I'll attach those other fingers. And yeah, those are already printed. But uh, yeah, excited about this. Very nice. Very nice. Um, oh, and a link to what we're watching. Okay, travel. That is this right here. Oh, the oldest rocks on Earth changed history. That is here. So the oldest rocks that we have are about four and a half billion years old. Or 4.1 billion years old. Something like that. So yeah. Yeah. Anyway. Thank you, Travel. Yeah. Uh, and strike a brink, strike a check. Strybrink, strike a check. How are you doing? Welcome back to Paleontologizing. It's good to have you here. Shoot, we have got a dinosaur deep dive that we've got to cover uh, from our very own Nader Fiend. The most extraordinary group of animals that have ever appeared on this planet. Oh, you're talking about dinosaurs. The dinosaurs. There you go. Ardent props, thank you for the follow. Welcome to Paleontologizing. Good to have you here. Thanks for... Uh, Thanks for following. And uh, Ali J, thank you for the hydrate. Cheers. Yeah. Hmm. Now, hoy hoy to you too, tumor boy. Welcome back. Yeah. Uh. Let's go ahead and talk about this critter. We've got a dinosaur deep dive requested by Nader Fiend. I would play the dinosaur deep dive. Um, you know, uh, video there, but YouTube freaks out when I, when I upload the VODs and it copyright strikes that part. 
So we're going to avoid that for now until I can find some sort of resolution. But, uh, yeah. Here we go. We have a dinosaur deep dive requested by Nader Fiend. Nader Fiend, are you still here? I hope you are. We have a particular dinosaur. Let me know if, uh, if you can guess what this is, everybody. But this is a dinosaur that is very well known here in North America. It's actually lent its name to a basketball team, if I'm correct about that. It is, uh... <laughs> it's pretty well known. I'll just say that, you know? Chances are maybe half of you here have seen one of these live in the flesh. Because we now know that birds are dinosaurs. This completely fits under the, the auspices of a dinosaur deep dive. Here we go. We call these laser birds. If you've laser never birds. one in real life, this may be difficult to appreciate. But here's an example of their laser-like call. Huh. There are other cardinal species, but we wanted to focus specifically on northern cardinals because we're so familiar with them and we didn't realize they aren't found all throughout the United States. Yeah. Northern cardinals are found from southern Canada all the way down into parts of Mexico and Central America. Westward, they've reached as far as southern California by expanding their range, which we'll huh. be discussing later. But they're interesting from the northwestern corner of the United States. Yeah. Plus, they aren't even found in other parts of the world, which is sad because they're fun birds to watch. No. I've never heard these called laser birds. There's another kind of bird that we had in the field that we like me and my whole crew called them laser birds. We'd be out there digging up triceratops and stuff like that. There were these birds there and they'd they'd be like zoom 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 pew 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 zoom zoom we call them laser birds, and I... Th they might be rock wrens? I'll look them up after this, but, uh... Yeah, a anywho. Yeah. Uh... <laughs> You're... <laughs> Absolutely right, Mayor Space, once again. Yes, definitely. Um... Shoot, yeah. Yeah, Power Ranger birds, Moimla. Call them whatever you like. There's a female right there. She's beautiful. Of course, we don't have kookaburras, uh. so maybe it evens out. Though they're protected under the Migratory Bird Act, northern cardinals don't migrate. This makes them huh. a common and typically welcome sight in winter. This can be especially uh. true of bright red males who can add a bit of color to what some consider an otherwise dreary landscape. Yeah, shoot, I do. Um... My my girlfriend in college, she lived in Wisconsin, and there were a couple of years when I went out to visit her and her family for New Year's or for Thanksgiving, and there's snow all over the ground there in southwest Wisconsin, you know, at the time, and, like, there would just be these fiery explosions of red all of a sudden, and then, like, these male cardinals would be flitting around, and they'd be visiting the bird feeders. Her dad would put out you know, bird feeders all the time, which I really appreciated. I love to see the birds. Um, I got to see all these birds that I was not familiar with because I didn't grow up in Wisconsin. I'm, from a, I'm a California boy, you know? And I lived in Montana at the time. I was not familiar with birds like this. So I remember the first time I saw a cardinal, it was like, holy cow, here's this bird that everybody knows about, but I'd never seen alive in the flesh or in the feather, as the case may be. Um, really, really beautiful bird. They're incredibly charismatic. They're so cool. Personally, we both have a fondness for the less ostentatious ladies. But to each yeah. other, female and juvenile northern cardinals have soft red tones with muted brown feathers, while yeah. males are almost impossible to miss in their red plumage, <laughs> even when they're foraging among shrubs. <laughs> they're almost obnoxious. They're so vibrant. To green leaves. Northern yeah. cardinals live in forests, along forest edges, in overgrown fields, and in backyards. 
Uh, Raptor says, I'm in Virginia where the cardinal is the state bird. Raptor, I'm glad you specified Virginia because the cardinal is the state bird for like way too many states. I think this video will talk about that a little bit. Um, but yeah, yeah. Altogether, too many states have the cardinal as their state bird. Yeah, yeah. Northern cardinals especially love singing from high areas. They also love to eat seeds like the goldfinches we talked about a few. And uh, Pfizer says you would think that predators would have no problem spotting these birds. Well, that's the thing, Pfizer. That's the thing is you got to think about which kind of predators, because if those predators are birds, then yeah, sure enough, those birds see in color. If we're talking about sparrowhawks or you know, any other kind of predatory bird. This bird is going to stick out like a sore thrum. They're, they're going to be able to see that. But if you're talking about mammalian predators, like cats or coyotes or grizzer bears, you know, they can't see in color. And so they're not going to be able to spot this bird at all. Like, it's just going to look gray to them because they, they can't see red. They literally can't. Um, so, yeah. Yeah. Uh, interesting to think about, right? Why well, we got to drag bears into this? Sorry, Claire Burr. I know. Yeah, yeah. Grizzer bears. They're not actually catching cardinals. But because uh, they can't see them, you know? Weeks ago. Yeah. Along with seeds, northern and cats are colorblind? They are. ASD, absolutely. Shoot, maybe we'll maybe we'll talk about that after this. But why most mammals are colorblind? We ourselves, as human beings, we are mammals. We can see in color, but we've kind of re-evolved that ability. Most of our mammalian comrades, you know, dogs and cats and squirrels and bats and whales and dolphins and antelopes and moose and platypus and kangaroos they cannot see in color they're all colorblind and that might be that might be because of dinosaurs so maybe we'll talk about that in a bit but yeah mostly colorblind yes yeah jody fish there you go they've got mostly rods in their eyes almost no cones so yeah yeah so anyway, yeah, um, and they're actually really, oh, interesting, Mayor Space, Red Crested Cardinal, we might look that up in a bit, yeah. What were the first animals to see in color? Fishes. Well, or maybe, maybe arthropods? I don't know, Darth Goop, that's a good question. It's a really good question, actually. I don't know the answer to that. Yeah. And just male cats or both? No, it's both, Waymla. Cats, in general, can't see in color. Except for, like, maybe, like, muddied shades of... I think it's, like, they can see shades of yellow and blue or something like that. And that's it. Anyway. Eat fruit yeah. And arthropods, such as katydids, centipedes, spiders, flies, and moths. Something yeah. funny about the diets of northern cardinals is that the adults consume mostly plant material. But the babies are fed mostly insects and other hmm. animals. Northern cardinals build their nests in dense thickets. The female does most of the construction, but the male helps her to locate materials with which to build it. It takes about a week to build the nest. The female will then lay one to five eggs and incubate them for just under two weeks. Once they've hatched, it takes just over a week for the baby northern cardinals to leave the nest. But huh. they'll stick around getting food from their parents until they're about two months old. So that is kind of wild. So, like, they... Shoot. <laughs> <laughs> until they're two months old that's it and then and then they're basically like bow you're an adult you're you're off doing your own thing doing what the adults do after two months that's so fast that's really crazy the cenozoic era should be like the age of you know what was that homer simpson quote uh <laughs> can i find that real quick um yeah And thank you, as the Kajumbla Kajau Kajau 
Thank you for the follow. Azd. I'll just call you Azd. Thanks for that follow. Welcome to Paleontologizing. Yeah. Uh. Mm -hmm. uh, I can't find a video clip here. But, uh... Imagine this in a March voice. Homer, do you remember your promise to the children? Sure do. When you're 18, you're out the door. <laughs> That's basically what the Cenozoic era is like. You know? Um, you know, whether it's mammals or birds, they mature very quickly, and they're in the same... They're immediately in the same niche as their parents. They're not moving through different... You know, different environmental niches, different ecological niches throughout their lifespans, like dinosaurs were. Yeah, yeah. Dope! There you go, Raptor. Yes. Yeah. Get a job, says the Northern Cardinal parents. Indeed. So, yeah. Northern Cardinals normally travel in small groups that are formed as the juveniles are kicked out from their parents' territory. Yeah. So it's typically not. And there you go, watcher. Sure. Yeah. To cuddle up with. They may yeah. produce two broods per year, though the second brood may be replaced by the eggs of brown-headed cowbirds, who uh -oh. will off other birds to raise their kids. Sometimes northern cardinal pairs stay together over the course of a few breeding seasons. Other times they'll mm. find a new mate. To attract a mate, the male puts on displays, makes calls, and offers food. Northern cardinals weigh just one and one half ounces and have up to a foot wingspan. They make tasty meals for hawks, owls, snakes, squirrels, and domestic and feral dogs and cats. That's kind of them. Yeah. Shoot, you know who else makes tasty meal? Tasty meals? I don't know if she's watching right now, but Lordy is not feeling well today. Can we get a shout out for Lordy real quick? She also makes very tasty meals. <laughs> Thank you, Claire Burke. Quick on the draw there. Yeah. Um, but yeah, yeah. Go follow Lordy if you'd like to learn how to make tasty meals yourself. Uh, maybe not in the same way that cardinals do for owls and snakes and etc. But uh, yeah. Oh, and Lordy, you are still watching. How are you doing, Lordy? <laughs> uh, Lordy makes very tasty meals, but not... Not in the same way as uh, as cardinals do. Yeah. Just one and one half ounces and have up to a foot wingspan. They make tasty meals for hawks, tasty owls, meals, snakes, squirrels, and domestic and feral dogs and cats. But Aww. if they can avoid these animals, they may live to be more than a decade old. Northern cardinals have done well for themselves in terms of expanding their population. Oh, uh, I hang on. I know this bird se bird feeder here. Oh boy, back when I was teaching, when I was teaching full time, a bunch of, uh, you know, when I was teaching early childhood education, we got a bunch of these feeders. My co teacher ordered them from uh, the internet. But this is a really cool feeder that you can get, a bird feeder, that you can attach to a soda bottle. Yeah. Uh, I don't know if there's anybody here in chat who drinks soda pop. Um, I don't know why I'm calling it that. <laughs> uh, but yeah, shoot, you can purchase a soda bottle bird feeder like this. Like it's a, it looks just like this. this is the same one. Yeah, hanging soda bottle bird feeder. It goes like that. It screws on to a two liter soda bottle. And, uh, yeah, and you can feed birds with it. Yeah. So, uh, and I betcha, I betcha, you could even 3D print that if, like me, you have a 3D printer, which I do. Unfortunately, the, uh, the, um, Uh, homeowners, uh, National Social Socialist Association, or whatever they call themselves. My apartment building doesn't, doesn't let you put out bird feeders. 
It's against the rules. But, um... Anyway, let me see if I can find a 3D printable. Soda bottle bird feeder. Um... Yeah... Oh boy, there we go. Yeah, soda bottle bird feeder right there on Thingiverse. Yeah. Beautiful. There's that. So if any of you have a 3D printer at home, you could print this and turn an ordinary soda bottle, water bottle, whatever, with the same kind of aperture into a bird feeder right there at home. Reduce, reuse, recycle. There you go, Triceratops. There you go. Yeah. Uh, and Mama M Media, I'm so sorry. They won't let you put up bird feeders either. I do have a hummingbird feeder for the hummingbirds in my neighborhood. It's true, Base Reflux. Thank you for the nine months of support, Base Reflux. Thank you, thank you. I really appreciate you. Welcome back. It's good to see you. But yeah, yeah. Um. Anyway, yeah. My my homeowners National Socialist Party, whatever they call themselves, they don't allow bird feeders. But they do allow hummingbird feeders, and I. This is in like the official charter for, for my apartment building. But they, it's, I kid you not, it's because they don't. Tac, tactical sponge, thank you for the 26 months. Extraordinary. That is beautiful, tactical sponge. Thank you, thank you for keeping me here on the air for the past 26 months. Incredible. As I was saying, my, yeah, the, I guess the charter for my apartment building or whatever, the, yeah. They do allow hummingbird feeders because <laughs> they somehow don't consider hummingbirds to be birds. They consider them to be insects. Um... It's like the Catholic Church declaring back in the, what, 17, 16 or 1700s that capybaras, capybaras and beavers are not animals, they're fish. And so they could be eaten on, on Fridays. So anyway, yeah. Uh, so yeah, anywho, yeah. Uh, you can eat hummingbirds for Lent, says Kutcher. There you go. Oh, no. I'm not gonna do that. I have questions, too. Necromancy, yeah. So, uh... Anyway, and I'm not kidding about that, either, with the whole, like, Catholic Church thing. Um, yeah. Uh... That... Uh... So... First of all, those of you who are wondering what I'm talking about, capybaras are these animals. Um, uh, capybara. Yeah. Um, these are capybara here. They're the world's largest rodents. They exist in the Amazon rainforest. South America. They're, uh... They're very cool animals. They're big old rodents, you know? Yeah. And, uh... Anyway, capybaras! That's a jaguar. Happy bars. Very cool critters. Look at those rodent teeth. Yeah. Uh, 
Anyway. Yeah. So here we go. Once upon a time, the Catholic Church decided that beavers were fish. <laughs> Along with capybaras and muskrats, too, I think. Yeah. From time to time, politicians and other rulers of men like to categorize the natural world not according to biology, but rather for convenience or monetary gain. Thank you, Trappy Jenkins, for that that gift sub. Thank you, thank you, Trappy. Appreciate that. Yeah. Um, yeah. Take, for example, the tomato. The progenitor of ketchup is a seed-bearing structure that grows in the flowering plant part of a plant. It is by definition a fruit. In 1893, however, the U.S. Supreme Court ruled in the case of Nex v. Hedden that the tomato was a vegetable subject to vegetable import tariffs. Even if the tomato is technically a fruit, it tends to be treated in American cuisine as a vegetable, wantonly littering our salads with its jello -y gooiness. I wonder if Lordy has anything to say about this, about the treatment of tomatoes as vegetables in American cuisine, despite obviously being a fruit, you know? Yeah. Uh, corn and rice are another good example. The Bible for forbids Jewish people from eating uh, chametz, foods made from wheat, barley, spy, spelt, rye, or oats, on Passover. Ashkenazi Jews consider corn, rice, and legumes, a class of food called uh, kitniot, as forbidden on Passover as well. It isn't that they're forbidden per se, but they're easily confused for the real thing. As I learned in my high school Talmud class, the medieval rabbis decided to forbid these not technically forbidden grains because of a principle called uh, marit ayin, which literally means what it looks like. The Wikipedia explanation is quite good. While not against the laws of Passover to consume kitniot, a person might be observed eating them and thought to be eating a chametz despite the law, or earnestly conclude that the chametz was permitted. To avoid this confusion, they were simply banned outright. You know, I I kind of get that. It kind of makes sense to a certain extent. You know? Yeah. Uh, anyway. Still, neither the Supreme Court's reclassification of tomato is a fruit, nor the medieval rabbi's designation of corn and rice as forbidden grains is the most amusing example of a non-scientific categorization. The Catholic Church has them all beat. Oh, boy. <laughs> uh, uh, oh, no. There were once between 60 and 400 million beavers. That's Castor Canadensis, or C. Canadensis. It's a call back there. Occupying the rivers and streams of North America, from the Great White North to the deserts of northern Mexico. Then, the Europeans came. Oh man, how often has that story been repeated? With them came disease, along with an insatiable desire for beaver pelts and for beaver castorium, a urine-like secretion that is often used in perfume and cologne. Combined with the once-sustained hunting of beaver by indigenous North Americans for their meat beaver population rapidly declined. Although the species is now rebounding thanks to trapping regulations that include 6 to 12 million individuals. They're making a comeback. Good for beavers. Yeah. In addition to disease, Catholic uh, European settlers also brought Euro Catholicism with them and successfully converted a large proportion of the indigenous population. And the Native Americans and Canadians loved their beaver meat. So in the 17th century, the Bishop of Quebec approached his superiors in the church and asked whether his flock would be permitted to eat beaver on Fridays during Lent, despite the fact that meat eating was forbidden. Since the semi-aquatic rodent was a skilled swimmer, the church declared that the beaver was a fish. There you have it. Not making that up. Being a fish, beaver barbecues were permitted throughout Lent. Problem solved. The church, by the way, also classified another semi-aquatic rodent, the capybara. There you go. That is this critter right here. 
the capybara. Man, what is up with this video? There's a bunch of... Yeah. There's capybara right there. Oh, man, it's like seizure induced. Uh, they classified the capybara as a fish for dietary purposes. The critter, the largest rodent in the world, is commonly eaten during Lent in Venezuela. It's delicious, one restaurant owner told the New York Sun in 2005. I know it's a rat. It's not a rat. It's a capybara. Grow up, dude. But it tastes really good. If sure. You know? Keep telling yourself that. Anyway, if you'd like to read this whole article, here is the link. They're very cute, Ice Allen. I would not want to eat them. You know? I typically don't try and eat, you know, my friends and colleagues, nor would I want to eat a capybara. You know? Yeah. So anyway, yeah. So yeah, yeah, anywho. Full disclosure, I'm not, I'm not much, I'm not much of a meat eater. I don't, I don't eat meat, you know? Unless I'm like out for a run and I accidentally swallow a June bug or something, you know? I'm not, I'm not really out there eating meat. So there you go, Clipper. Yeah, not a carnivore, you know? Um... So yeah, yeah. And does anybody like octopus, brownabus? Why would you, why would you eat such an intelligent, amazing animal? Holy cow! Yeah. Um. Uh. People think they can just eat whatever critters they want. You know? Let's eat some dolphins. Let's eat some chimpanzees. Let's eat some. Octopus. Yeah. This is a... If you've never seen this documentary before, I would highly recommend it. Holy cow. This is called Octopus in My House from BBC Earth. And, uh... Man, is it worth watching. Really good stuff. Yeah. Holy cow. Yep. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Very cool. Are squid intelligent? I don't know if they're... I bet you they are, Freya's Fury. I bet you they are. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you didn't see this, but that octopus built octopus, you know, built that entire Lego structure there, you know? Um Yeah. I'm just kidding. It didn't. They they sunk it into the cage. But uh th this is built by people. But you know, they they figure stuff out. Oh, this is really cool. Watch this. <laughs> 
Very cool. <laughs> Playing a game, you know? Isn't that incredible? Yeah, it's playing catch with itself. There you go, Booty Raider. Yeah, they're very smart. Yeah. Oh, so that's Laurel right there. Uh, so that's, um, I forget his name, but the scientist here, who's like the subject of this documentary, along with the octopus. Her name is Heidi, because when they first got her, she would hide so often. This is such a cool documentary because, uh, holy cow, it, this is like a, a wonderful documentary for our times. This happened during COVID. So, uh, you know, this scientist here who studies octopuses, he had like a documentary film crew with him. And this is like when the COVID lockdown took place. He couldn't be, like, in the laboratory or out and about. So they just take a, an octopus and they put it there into this tank in his house. And the documentary is called Octopus in My House. And he just interacts with it every day. He gets to know it. Kind of probes its intelligence. It's really, really cool. So, uh, yeah. And you're right, I don't know, Kev. Yeah, they do. They live, like, a year or two. Octopus have a very short lifespan. Yeah. And yet they're incredibly intelligent and perceptive animals. I know as human beings, we're used to thinking of like intelligent animals as living a long time, gaining a lot of experience, that kind of thing. But octopus... Yeah. They live about a year, and they breed, and they die. So yeah, yeah. Like, my octopus teacher. There you go, Naderfiend. Yeah. Really good. Good documentary. It's so good, like, I wondered if it was real. It's like... It was... It was almost too good to be true. Yeah. Yeah. And Mayor Space says, The humans are actually the pets of the octopus. Is keeping in a pink terrarium. <laughs> I hope not, Mayor Space. I hope not. But anyway. Yeah. Yeah. Now, now she's, now you say hello to me. Oh. Octopuses have up to 240 suckers on their arms. Each has sensitive chemical receptors. Yeah. Heidi can touch and taste Laurel at the same time. Oh, she just, she just lightly. So they can actually taste with their suckers, which is really cool. Octopus also have estrogen like humans do. Is it possible that Heidi can be detecting the estrogen on Laurel's skin? Huh. Does Heidi maybe taste the difference between males and females? Heidi. Huh. Her arm is now up my sleeve. <laughs> Heidi, oh. you're, you're, being, you're being naughty. She's lifting herself almost all the way out of the tank right now. Wow. That's that now, siphon yeah. going <laughs> squirting out all that water. Of Laurel having any kind of relationship with a mollusk is extraordinary when you think about it. Yeah, it is. Holy cow. This is an animal that has 600 million years of distance from us. That's why we're watching this on paleontologizing right now, because we have that, that evolutionary perspective right there. 600 million years of distance from us. Probably... Probably more, honestly. Like, it is that long between we have had, between, like, ourselves as mammals and cephalopods like this octopus here, you know? Um, shoot. There is a lot of time separating us from this creature right here. You could look at it as 600 million years of difference because it's been 600 million years since we've shared a common ancestor. Or you could say it's double that, 1,200 million years, because we've each had, each of us, you know, us as mammals and octopus as cephalopods, we've had 600 million years of divergence there. You could say there's 1,200 million years separating us, 1.2 billion years, you know? I, it, 
And yet here is an animal which is incredibly, incredibly intelligent by just about any measure. Really cool. Is yeah. Extraordinary when you think about it. <laughs> and Gojira says it's got a built-in comedy squirting flower. Yes, indeed. Going. <laughs> Yes. This is an animal that has yeah. 600 million years of distance from us. Or 1.2 billion, depending on how you count it. Yeah. Any divide can be between two animals. Yeah. Yeah. With three hearts, no bones, a beak with a venomous bite, and a gut that runs through its brain, to one point of view, the octopus is completely alien. Yeah. Think about that. Science fiction movies have long demonstrated humans spend a lot of imagination dreaming up what it might be like to meet an alien. Yeah. The filmmakers imagine what it might be like to encounter a species that changes the way we think about the universe. <laughs> Super, super cool. If you have not seen this before. Thank you, Lilith Hobo. For that raid, welcome. Lilith Hobo, how you doing? How was your stream? Hope it was excellent. You were playing something called... Never Winter Nights Enhanced Edition. Oh, so it's got to be... Spring, summer, or fall, then, right? Well, I hope you had a great time with it. Welcome, welcome to Paleontologizing. Good to have you here. And uh, always summer days. There you go, Necromancy. Yeah. Excellent. Do people know this? Do people know this game? I. You know me. I'm not I'm not a video game guy. But uh, was Lilithobo playing a uh, uh, certified excellent game there? Cool. Anyway, I appreciate you, Lilith Hobo. It's good to see you. And welcome, welcome, Moo Hoodles. How are you doing? It's great to see you. I hope all is well. Yeah. And if anybody would like to see Octopus in my house in its entirety, uh, I think I can give you this link here on Daily Motion. You can also look it up if you have British Broadcasting Corporation streaming service or whatever. If you're a UK resident, I bet you you can find it. But check that out. Octopus in my house. Really, really good stuff. Yeah. Um. Yeah. Extraordinary documentary there. I think you'll really, really like it. It is told from the perspective of a scientist who kind of adopts an octopus to live in his house during the COVID lockdown and uh, lives there with... Uh, he's He'd been recently divorced, I think. So the octopus is living there with him and his daughter. And no, that is not the premise for a sitcom. <laughs> or, or maybe it is. If that's what gets you to watch it, then sure. Yeah, go watch it. But it's good stuff. It's really, really excellent. Um... I think you'll like it a lot. Yeah. Uh, octopus in my house. Good stuff. Good stuff. But it'll it'll kind of... Hopefully... Get you to think about what does the word intelligence mean? When we think of intelligent animals, what are we thinking of? You know? Yeah. And if you're a science fiction aficionado, holy moly, it'll get to, uh, maybe your vision of, like, extraterrestrial intelligence will also change. You know, like in, uh, in Star Trek, how, like, almost all of the aliens look just like humans for the most part? Uh, yeah... Um, let's see. Star Trek species list? Will that work? 
all Federation members. Um, yeah, they all tend to tend to be pretty, uh, you know, pretty humanoid looking, you know. Yeah, and this is look at the it's these are just like humans with makeup, you know. Um, <laughs> they're all very humanoid looking. They've got eyes in the same place. They've got two ears. They've got a mouth. They've got a nose, you know? Yeah. You see what I'm talking about? Yeah. And that's because this is a show that had like, you know, they had a very finite budget and they had human actors and everything. But you look at intelligent creatures on our planet today and they are wildly different from one another. You know? Like, humans, and primates, and birds, and octopus, and, you know, critters like that that have, like, wildly, wildly different body forms. You know? These are all following the same basic, like, human body plan, where you've got a head up here, two eyes, a nose, a mouth. There you go. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah. Yeah, we need octopus actors, says Chucky. There you go. Yeah. Give us amorphous slug boys, says Necromanty. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> and that was the guy from the My Inner Your Inner Fish film. Yes, it was. Claire Burr, the same actor. What was his name? Mike Michael Berryman, I think is his name. Yeah. Um, look, she's just a person. She's just a person. You know... He's just the person who's blue. Uh, he's mostly a person, you know? Uh, anyway. Yeah. That literally a person. Literally a person. You know? Literally a person. Oh, boy. You get the idea. Um, so, yeah. Yeah. Uh, and Triceratops, I agree. They actually did a really good job of that in that movie, um, Arrival. Um, yeah. I highly recommend that movie. Really good stuff. Um, but yeah, like these critters in the movie Arrival. Uh, really, really good stuff, where they come across as, like, very alien, you know? Um, if you've not seen the movie Arrival, you should check it out, but they do an excellent job of having, like, critters that evolved on some distant planet somewhere else where that don't look anything like us. And that has been like in my in my experience in my from my perspective as a paleontologist, somebody who studies evolution. There's no reason if if there were an intelligent creature that evolved somewhere on a planet light years from our own, there is absolutely zero 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 reason to think it would look anything at all like us. You know? That's why... I don't know. To a paleontologist... Uh, this idea of, like, aliens... You know... Aliens looking like... Looking like this... Is just completely laughable. Like... Pee yourself laughing. Hilarious. There is precisely zero reason to think that anything that evolved on another planet would look anything close to this, you know? Because even different creatures that live on our own planet right now that have also developed intelligence look nothing like us, like the octopus, for instance, you know? You know, I suppose it has two eyes, but the similarity kind of stops there. It's got eight limbs, it's got, what, three hearts? It's got a venomous beak. <laughs> it, it, 
it doesn't have eyelids. It's like it's just completely, completely different from anything that pop culture has managed to come up with, you know? So yeah, why would they be tetrapods? Exactly, Jody Fish. Exactly. And Muhoodle says, yes, our sci-fi is generally based off of stuff similar to what we already know. I think I want to say that Neil deGrasse Tyson might even have a rant about this. Um, let's see. Um, oh, YouTube shorts. Do I want to watch this? don't actually i hate youtube shorts garbage um and we're not gonna find this never mind um but yeah anyway there is i think it was neil degrasse tyson he thought that like the most realistic movie alien was the blob from the movie the blob you know just completely different from anything that we have here on earth except for maybe like an amoeba or something Oh, yeah. Yeah. And, uh... And Moo Hoodles probably has a rant about... Do you, Moo Hoodles? There you go. That's the thing. Even here on our own planet, intelligent creatures look so different from one another. You know? We have primates. We have birds. We have octopus. You know? Cuttlefish. Um, there was a really, really cool video that I saw, uh, yeah, where was that? Here we go. Let's check this out right here. This was really, 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 really interesting. Here is a doc, uh, a quick little video from PBS, no PBS Nova about cuttlefish. I'm going to play this, and I'm going to go run to the little paleontologist room. I'll be back in just a minute, because I've got to, um, as the kids say, um, expel some urine. I will be right back. Uh, enjoy this in the meantime. You're about to witness a groundbreaking, yet oddly adorable, psychological experiment. This cuttlefish, after days of training will succeed in a test of temptation originally designed for humans, challenging our understanding of the origins of intelligence. Which is surprising because... Cuttlefish are widely different from humans. They live relatively solitary lives. They have three hearts. They have a beak, like a parrot. Uh, they also have little muscles that can extend to make their skin look bumpy. It can change texture and color within the blink of an eye. But to survive, cuttlefish seem to need one more trick. Mind over matter. This child is taking part in a now famous, similarly adorable experiment. In the Stanford Marshmallow Experiment, preschool age kids are given a single marshmallow. They're told they can eat it immediately, or they could wait 15 minutes for the experiment to return. If they're able to resist temptation for 15 minutes, they would get a second marshmallow. TV shows and parents have tried the marshmallow experiment on different kinds of kids just to see all the cuteness that happens when a kid is trying to resist a marshmallow. Many people have recreated this experiment posting adorable videos of kids displaying specific <laughs> interesting behaviors. I could not resist the marshmallow or the... Maybe it's different when you have to go to the bathroom. I don't know. Thank you for your patience, chat, while I went to go do that. But, um... Anyway, yeah. Good stuff, good stuff. This is, uh... Eat it and the world ends, says Necromanty. Oh, no. <laughs> Let's the check it out. Who are able to do the best in the marshmallow experiment are the ones who can distract themselves away from that marshmallow. Yeah. So often they'll look away or close their eyes or sing a little song to themselves, or even pretend that that marshmallow is something else. Delayed gratification <laughs> is the ability to resist the temptation of an immediate pleasure in the service of a long-term, more valuable reward. And so this sounds like something that's pretty, to use kind of a weasel word, pretty advanced, right? Like, we would think that any animal that can delay gratification like that 
would probably be fairly intelligent, right? That seems like a pretty high-order skill there, right? Could the lowly cuttlefish do this also? Let's talk about it. Yeah. And Wolf Sanger says, I've seen this test, and it's and how it's not a fair test for humans, or at least more complicated than simply delayed gratification. That might well be true. Well, uh, yeah, Wolf Sanger, yeah, yeah. Would you care to elaborate? I, I'd love to hear more about that. Because oftentimes a test that seems so devilishly simple like that, it turns out to actually be more complicated in real life. But, uh, yeah. Yeah. Anywho, we'll continue the video for now. Uh, play. So the ability to delay gratification uh, usually starts to develop around three or four years of age. And by age five, usually most kids are pretty good at this. This experiment has been adapted to look for self-control in animals. One hmm. really important way we try to understand the evolution of cognition, including the origins of human cognition, is by looking out into the natural world and trying to see how other animals think and solve problems. And shoot, um, that whole idea of cognition in the first place is such a, like, complicated and troublesome problem. There's a really, really cool talk that I saw from uh, from Dan Dennett about that. Yeah. Uh, there's a TED talk about it here but from Dan Dennett called The Illusion of Consciousness. If you're fascinated by topics like this, I would highly recommend it. There it is in chat. But uh, we're not going to watch it now. We're going to stick to this uh, cuttlefish video. But yeah. Yeah. Gojira says, My cat thinks knocking stuff off... Knocking stuff over is the best way to discover what it is. He's not wrong. I mean, as long as he doesn't knock over any... Any hand grenades missing their pins. Or... Any uh, nitroglycerin or anything, Gojira. Then yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah... Uh, Xanatos Gambit, the marshmallows, leave the one on the plate, eat a few from the stash. There you go, PX Sharon, yeah. Yeah. Uh, and Iwix Arts, I've been back. How you doing, Iwix Arts? Yeah. Can you put a pin back into a hand grenade? That's if the, well, were we talking about an American hand grenade? Anthem Ono? Shoot. I like a classic, uh... Classic World War II American pineapple grenade like this. You can put the pin back in if the lever is still depressed. Then you can put the pin back in. If the lever is not depressed, then there's a six-second fuse. Six seconds, give or take. And then you gotta, you gotta throw it because it's gonna go boom. So yeah, yeah. A Mark II frag, the spoon. See, Claire Burr knows more about this than I do. Uh, Claire Burr, I don't know if you know this chat, but Claire Burr, she fought in World War II. And, uh, yeah. Yeah, so she could tell you all about this. So, yeah. Yeah. Uh, keep talking and nobody explodes, is weird. I don't know if, I don't know if that's true. Um, but anyway. Yeah, it was a thing, says Claire Burr. Yeah. That is the the most casual I've heard anybody ever speak about the Great World War II. Yeah, it was it was a thing, Claire Burr. It was indeed. Yeah. <laughs> Back to cuttlefish. We tested delayed gratification uh, primates by giving them a decision between a smaller amount of food they could have right now and a larger amount of food that they had to wait some delay to receive. Uh, we found that chimpanzees were willing to wait about two minutes in order to get four extra grapes. Uh, Up until recently, advanced self-control like this... Hang on, grapes? Those look like tomatoes. Are... I guess they're grapes. 
Yeah, okay, I'll take their word for it. Extra great. Up until recently, yeah. advanced self-control like this had only been observed in social species such as apes, crows, and parrots. Ah. The social intelligence hypothesis. So hang on, that is one mammal and hypothesis proposed apes, crows, and parrots. And two dinosaurs. Holy cow. Once again, dinosaurs got beat mammals two to one. <laughs> <laughs> oh boy. Yeah. Yeah. The social intelligence hypothesis proposes that more complex cognition evolves in response to social pressures because animals need to constantly outwit others or cooperate uh. with others in order to be successful. One important component of intelligence is self control, especially when it comes to being social. But mm. if cuttlefish who are solitary have self-control, then there may be a different or perhaps second non-social origin to self-control and intelligence. Interesting idea. So these are what we call non-social animals. These are animals that presumably live on their own. They're not, you know, they're not living in groups or anything like that. They're pretty solitary. And yet they still have this incredible intelligence it seems that's evolved which is really interesting yeah and my dog shares her toys and food with her cat yes she has a cat says kochira your dog sounds pretty generous there kochira that's pretty cool yeah here at the marine biological laboratory in massachusetts alex massachusetts last i checked chicago is not in massachusetts here at the marine bio Hmm. It seems the University of Chicago is expanding outwards. Anyway. Biological laboratory in Massachusetts. Alex Schnell. <laughs> Roger Hanlon and their colleagues devised a way to adapt the marshmallow test for cuttlefish. Oh, this is super cool. In this cool. experiment, we wanted to Very test cool. whether the cuttlefish could wait for a preferred prey item over a less preferred prey item. So the first step of the experiment is to determine the prey preferences of each cuttlefish. We offer huh. the cuttlefish two different types of prey, live prey and non-live prey. Hmm. These cuttlefish are usually fed pre-frozen Also known as dead prey. There's the dead prey there. <laughs> but cuttlefish are very visual predators so more often than not they prefer live prey over non-live prey aka dead prey you know let's not euphemize it um they killed those poor shrimp <laughs> for science presumably yeah and necromancy says i wish somebody would feed me scrimps on a long stick you know the sky's the limit, Necromanty. I bet you, I bet you someday you will, you will have somebody feed you shrimp on a long stick. Uh, you know? Someday. Someday, Necromanty. Since scientists haven't quite figured out how to sit these tentacled test subjects down to describe the rules of the experiment, the researchers created a system of underwater chambers to get the idea across. This is so cool. The experimental design here, I think, is really creative and wonderfully simple. I mean, take a look at this. Really, really elegant experimental design. Uh, take a look at that. Uh, um, and wouldn't uh, Frank Big Time, welcome, Frank, says, would an animal that passes up an uninteresting meal because it is full but still eat a treat Kind of is very similar to this restraint. I think, Frank Big Time, they've... I would hope that they had accounted for that variable there. Where they're, they're feeding animals, like they're feeding cuttlefish that are... You know, it's like an experiment happening at the same time every day. So the animal has the same basic level of hunger each day. You know, you can never, like... Turn all of your variables down to zero, but I presume that they have that they've tried to do that here. They've tried to account for all of those variables. You know? Yeah. Anyway. Um play. 
We present a cuttlefish with a chamber marked with a circle. First, we lower the chamber into the tank with the cuttlefish. We drop some food in there. Ooh. Bink. And then as the cuttlefish approaches <laughs> the chamber, we open the door immediately so the cuttlefish can access the food inside. We then present the cuttlefish with a chamber marked with a triangle. We lower this chamber into the tank, Ooh. drop some food inside, but okay. this time when the cuttlefish approaches, the door doesn't open. The cuttlefish usually responds by attacking the chamber with its feeding tentacles. But the door won't open for several seconds for up to a few minutes. Man, imagine being that crayfish right there. It's like, uh-oh. <laughs> Here's death staring me in the face. Here is beaky, venomous death staring me right in the face. I, oh boy. Yeah, ugh. Finally, when the door opens, the cuttlefish strikes the prey inside, shooting out its feeding tentacles. R.I.P. that crayfish. Yowza. Yowza. After a few days, uh. the cuttlefish learns that the chamber with the circle means that the prey within can be accessed immediately. Just like a crack in necromancy, yeah. The triangle can only be accessed <laughs> after a delay. Uh. The next step is to train the cuttlefish to learn that the choice between the two food items is mutually exclusive. It can only take one prey item, the other one will be removed. We lower So that that is really really important. So here we'll rewind a little bit. But trying to like teach this animal the rules of the experiment. It's really clever how they did this. Let's take a look. With the triangle can only be accessed after a delay. Uh. The next step is to train the cuttlefish to learn that the choice between the two food items is mutually exclusive. It can uh. only take one prey item, the other one will be removed. One and there done. Both chambers inside the tank, but this time they are not marked with any visual shapes. We drop huh. the same prey items inside each chamber. When the cuttlefish approaches <laughs> one chamber to access the food inside, the food in the other chamber is immediately removed. So the cuttlefish quickly <laughs> learns that it can only... I love how there's a little fishing line or a thread attached to the other crayfish and they just go whoop and they lift it up right there. Did you see that? Watch, watch, watch. ...chamber is immediately removed. <laughs> watch, watch, watch. So the cuttlefish quickly learns that it can only eat one of the prey <laughs> items inside one. Uh, now we can move on to the final phase of the experiment, where we test for self-control in the cuttlefish. We insert both chambers into the cuttlefish tank, one marked with a circle and one marked with a triangle. Okay. Remember, the circle's associated with food that's accessible immediately, while the triangle signifies food that the cuttlefish needs to wait for. In the ah. chamber with the circle, we drop... And I like that little bit of narration there. Did you catch that, everybody? Are you on the same level as the cuttlefish in this experiment? Here, pay attention. Remember, the circle's associated with food that's accessible immediately, while the triangle signifies food that the cuttlefish needs to wait for. Ah. In the chamber with the circle, we drop non-live prey, which is less preferable. And then in the chamber with the triangle, we drop live prey, which is more preferable. The cuttlefish is now faced with a difficult decision. It can access the less preferable non-live prey in the circle chamber immediately. So it can get the dead shrimp right now and then have the crayfish brought back up to the surface and, you know, no longer accessible. Or it can be patient and forswear the eating of the dead shrimp and instead wait patiently for the live crayfish, which it prefers. What's it going to do? Hmm. Immediately. Or it can wait for the door to open in the delay chamber so it can access the preferable prey. What's it going to do? If the door to the shrimp opens, the cuttlefish waits. It's ah. It's have learned that if it goes for the non-live shrimp, then its preferred food, the live crawfish, will be removed. Interesting. Very, very interesting here. But like those kids that we saw who were like distracting themselves, 
from eating the marshmallows so they could later get two marshmallows, you know? We'll see if the cra- if the cuttlefish does something similar here. If our cephalopod friend finds a way to distract itself, this is going to be pretty interesting. This is a challenging decision. So the cuttlefish tries to distract itself by looking away from the prey that's immediately available. <laughs> Which is reminiscent of some of the children's behavior in the marshmallow experiment. <laughs> Holy cow! Minute, wow! ...finally opens to the delay chamber, and the cuttlefish that's been waiting very patiently can finally access its reward inside. Can you believe that? This is the first time that we've seen advanced cell control in an invertebrate species, in a species that isn't long-lived and isn't social. That's pretty extraordinary. It's that an animal like a cuttlefish can succeed in such a problem. <laughs> this tells us that you don't need to be living in a complex social environment in order to evolve this particular skill. And you don't need to be, for instance, you need to be living in a complex a primate or a dinosaur. <laughs> cuttlefish can do this too. Really, really cool. In order to evolve yeah. this particular skill. So in this hypothesis, animals evolve more complex cognition because of the difficulties of finding food in their natural uh. As for why cuttlefish may have developed this intelligent behavior, Alex Schnell has a hypothesis. Cuttlefish hmm. stay camouflaged for the majority of the time, but in order to pursue food, they need to break camouflage, which exposes them to predators. This is like this uh, stand tiger shark right here. Man, these are like the scariest shark in any aquarium, and I don't think they've ever been documented at biting a human. They're like the scariest sharks around. Sand tiger sharks, I think, are like objectively some of the very scariest of all sharks. Um, holy cow, yeah. Sand tiger shark. This time no, that's not what I'm looking for. Um, I don't know. These are like among the. You see them in aquarium, aquaria all the time. These critters are, I don't know. Something about them is just like very ominous, and yet, I don't think they ever actually attack people. You know. Um. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> Ooh, holy cow. Uh, yeah, this is not the kind of shark that you want swimming up to you, but I don't, I don't think they ever actually, like, bite people, you know? They look dangerous, but yeah, but they're definitely not. Uh, Gojira says, all the nurse sharks, are, is this a kind of nurse shark? I know nurse sharks proper, they don't really have, like, external teeth like this. But, um, yeah, the really big ones. I remember at growing up in the San Francisco Bay Area on rare occasions, I got to visit Marine World Africa USA, which was later purchased by Six Flags. Um, uh,. The shark experience there was really something. And, uh, oh, there we go. Shark experience here at Marine World Africa USA. And they had a bunch of sand tiger sharks there in the enclosure. There's like some reef sharks or somebody. But the sand tiger sharks were really the star of the show. They had the. There's a nurse shark, leopard sharks, it's like a horned shark or somebody. Uh, horned sharks. Anyway, it was, uh, it was pretty cool. And they had these, like, huge sand tiger sharks. And they're, like, they're harmless, you know? Even though they look really, really scary. So anyway, yeah. In Vallejo, there you go, Claire Burr. Yes, indeed. In Vallejo, California. Yeah. 
Wabagongs are very cute sharks, Scout. I agree. Yeah. Uh. You remember the commercials, though, Luna Seer? That's funny. I don't remember ever seeing commercials. But I remember the... I remember the sharks, for sure. Yeah. And Wabagongs bite the most? You're kidding me, Allie J. Do they bite in self-defense because they're scared or something? Yeah. And Lunasir, you said Vallejo earlier? Well. Uh, let's see. Marine World Shark Experience. Here might be more video of that. It was really cool. I remember this when I was a kid. Those are reef sharks there. Where's our sand tiger sharks? They're really slow moving, very laconic. They're not even there. Shoot. But they're, um, man, are they something. Here we go. Yeah, this is it right here. So you would go in through these. Man, they got rid of the flaps? What's up with that? But you'd go in through this dark tunnel like this. And they had, oh, they cut this part up, but there was all these black lights and like big shark silhouettes on the walls of different kinds of sharks. And then you go in through the moving walkway like this. It was a shark tunnel. Yeah. Very cool. I wonder if this is still in existence. I wonder if this is still going. There's a reef shark right there. And then when you get through the shark tunnel, they had all these really cool informational exhibits on sharks, which I really loved when I was a kid. There's some nurse sharks there just hanging out on the bottom. They're not dead. They just like to hang out on the bottom. So unlike a lot of sharks that need to keep swimming to keep breathing, these guys can just hang out in one place. And they can actually siphon water through their gills, through their mouth and then through their gills in order to breathe. So yeah... There's another reef shark. Man, this looks so much more empty than when I was a kid. I remember there being sharks everywhere. There's a, what is this, a pompano or something? Or a jack, maybe? What kind of fish is this? Anyway. Yeah, and there's some of the informational exhibits there. Anyway. And also in Vallejo. That's not in Vallejo, Ash Girl. I was just there. That is in Fairfield, California, which I think borders Vallejo. They're they're right there. They they share a border. Uh that's uh Fairfield, California, the Jelly Belly factory. Which used to be here in Oakland, California. Now it's in uh Fairfield. Yeah. Uh, they've got sea lions now? Very cool. I didn't know that. That's pretty nifty. Yeah. Anyway. Iakin says, I was at the Ripley's Aquarium in Toronto about a year and a half ago. In the big tank, there was a dude inside cleaning the glass and stuff. A kid runs up like, people, there's people in there. And the mom asked him what they were doing. After a few moments, the kid's eyes lit up and they said, fighting the fish. I chose to believe him. Oh, boy, Ian Kane. Well, for the fish's sake, I hope the fish won, you know? Yeah. So anyway. Yeah. Anyway. And yet yeah, my grandmother used to live in Fairfield, California, Linus here. Yeah. Spent a lot of time in Fairfield over the years. Anywho. Yeah. Uh, but we were talking about cephalopods. Yeah. Why cuttlefish may have developed this intelligent behavior? Yeah. Chanel has a hypothesis. Ah. Uh. Stay camouflaged for the majority of the time, but in order to pursue food, they need to break camouflage, which exposes hmm. them to predators. This like the sand tiger shark. Survival, since unlike other mollusks, like clams, they have no outer shell to protect them from predators. Huh. Cuttlefish might have evolved self-control in order to optimize their predatory excursions to attack ah. their prey at the right time and to limit their exposure to predators. 
In the wild, something like a non-live shrimp may not be valuable enough to take the risk, whereas a live crayfish would be. So this could be evolutionary advantageous for the cuttlefish. What this kind of work tells us is that we can look out into the natural world to creatures that look so different from us with different kinds of... Thank you, thank you, Magi Squared, for the follow. Welcome to Paleontologizing. Of lifestyle and still yeah. the same glimmers of intelligence. And that brings us to other questions about whether we could find self-control in other non-social animals. Huh. Because these cuttlefish have shown that you don't need to be social to develop agency or willpower. You just huh. need to be a picky, risk-averse eater. Those qualities may even be part of why we, and other vertebrates, all of whom forage and try to avoid predators, have self-control. The ability to hold off on what's in front of us and save room for dessert. Interesting stuff. Interesting indeed. Yeah. I, for one, wonder how many people in our day and age, in this age of instant gratification, and YouTubes and Tink Tonks and etc. Facebooks have any kind of self control left. But yeah, thank you, Magic Squared, for the hydrate. Cheers. Let's do a dinosaur deep dive. For Layer T there. Layer T once again has redeemed the dinosaur deep dive. For a bird. Birds are, of course, living dinosaurs. Birds are the only group of dinosaurs that we still have around right now, today, in our modern age. So let's go ahead and do that. Confucius Ornus is this kind of fossil bird. Confucius Ornus. There you go. Uh, that's a pretty, well, it's a Facebook image. Shoot, hang on. There we go. Confucius Ornus. This is a kind of fossil bird that is known from so many specimens that we can actually learn a great deal about it. This is a bird that lived alongside the dinosaurs in the early Cretaceous period. And, uh... There's potentially an interesting case of sexual dimorphism here, where you see those two long feathers coming off of the tail right there? Those may have only been present in one of the sexes, or maybe both, and maybe the one that doesn't have either of them is pathological or a different species. But, uh, yeah, Confucius Ornus. Cool stuff. Let's talk about this critter. There is a beautiful just exquisite fossil of this animal. Take a look at that, including those feathers. Extraordinary. Yeah. So, Confucius Ornus. As a genus of basal crow-sized avialan, it's a bird, from the early Cretaceous period of the Yishan and Jufotang formations of China, dating from about 125 to 120 million years ago, so potentially a, a span there of about 5 million years. I wonder how much of that is due to dating inconsistencies and, um, and imperfections. How much of that's legit. But like modern birds, Confucius Ornus had a toothless beak. But closer and later relatives of modern birds, such as Hesperonus and Ichthyornis, were toothed. Yeah... Confucius Ornus is one of the most abundant vertebrates found in the Yishan Formation. This is the same formation that our beloved Sinornithosaurus is from. And Microraptor and Sinoceropteryx and a bunch of other dinosaurs like that. So yeah, yeah. Really extraordinary. So there's another Confucius Ornus specimen. This one does not have the long tail feathers coming off of, off of it. Could be a female... Or could potentially be a different species, different growth stage. We don't really know yet. But there is presumably maybe a male with those two long tail feathers? It's hard to say. Yeah. So in November of 1993, the Chinese paleontologist Hao Lianghai and Hu Liaoming 
of the University of Vertebrate Paleontology and Paleoanthropology, the IVPP, at Beijing, visited fossil collector Zhang He at his hometown in Jinshou, where he showed them a fossil bird specimen that he had bought at a local flea market. Kind of crazy. Yeah. In December... Uh, Howe learned that a second specimen, which had been discovered by a farmer named, uh, had been discovered by a farmer named Yang Yushan. Both specimens were found in the same locality in Shangyuan, Beipiao. In 1995, two, these two specimens, as well as a third one, were formally described as a new genus and species of bird, Confucius Ornus Sanctus, by Howe and colleagues. The generic name combines the philosopher Confucius with the Greek Ornus for bird. And the specific name means holy one in Latin. And is a translation of the Chinese uh, Sheng Xian, a sage, again in reference to Confucius. So we've got a bird that is named after philosopher... Confucius. There you go. Confucius. His philosophy uh, rings throughout China to this very day and throughout other parts of the world as well. Has a fossil bird named after him and quite an important fossil bird, if I may say so myself. Uh, this is a wonderful example of a critter that's known from many many specimens in paleontology the more specimens that a taxon a taxon is like a genus or a species a taxon is a kind of critter you know the more specimens that a taxon is named from is is known from the more cool science we can do on that taxon because it means we've got more data so yeah yeah um, no telling what kind of rarities end up in flea markets. Jesus, I agree. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, yeah, have, absolutely. Yeah. Uh, so Confucius Ornus, when we compare it to our Archaeopteryx over here, Confucius Ornus shows a mixel, a uh, mix, a mixel, a mix of basal and derived traits. It was more advanced or derived than Archaeopteryx over here in possessing a short tail with a pygostyle. The pygostyle is kind of the little tail nubbin that modern birds have that the, the tail feathers stick out of. Modern birds don't have a long bony tail like their dinosaur ancestors do. Instead, they've got like a little bony nubbin right there. Yeah. So Confucius Ornus had that. And it had a bony sternum or breastbone but more basal or primitive features than modern birds have, like large claws on the forelimbs. So this is a bird with claws on its wings. In fact, I think I have a book with some illustrations of Confucius Ornus. Let me pull those up. Yeah. Yeah, here we go. This is in the Dorling Kindersley Dinosaur Encyclopedia. And let me just say, I'm a little bit, a little bit embarrassed, a little bit embarrassed as a dinosaur paleontologist that a book about the history of fossil organisms, you know, throughout the world is so heavily focused on dinosaurs. Like, yes, dinosaurs are really, really cool, but dinosaurs aren't necessarily the only critters, you know? Paleontology is a study of fossils in general. You know, dinosaurs get a lot of attention here, and there are a lot of creatures in this book. Not all of them are dinosaurs, but it gets called Dinosaur Encyclopedia because they knew this would sell more copies. Anyway, we start off long before the dinosaurs here. You know, uh, earliest tetrapods, stuff like that. Yeah, Stemnosuchus, blah, blah, blah. Anyway, where's Confucius Ornus? Let's get to that critter. 
Uh, ceratopsians, mammals. Murm, murm, murm. Let's get back to our theropods. There we go. Confucius Ornus. Yeah. Whoop. Confucius bird. Yeah. There is our Confucius Ornus right there. And check out those feather, uh, those claws on its wings. Excuse me. Yeah. There we go. Confucius Ornus. And, yeah, here they're saying that, well, this one has long tail feathers. That Confucius Ornus females had a short tail. We don't know that 100% for sure, but it is, it does make a lot of sense. If that were the case, it would answer a lot of questions. So, that might very well be the case. Yeah. Uh, PX Sharon says, Klaatu Barada Nictosaurus. <laughs> PX Sharon. Holy cow, PX Sharon. Um, combining references to 1950s science fiction and late Cretaceous vertebrate paleontology. PX Jeron, that's some excellent stuff there. Yeah. That book there is the Dorling Kindersley Dinosaur Encyclopedia. I, I honestly can't recommend this anymore. It's a little bit too out of date. This was in vogue maybe when I was a kid. You know? There are more up-to-date references nowadays than this. So I, I really can't recommend it, you know? Yeah. And very funny Trappy Jenkins. Thank you, thank you, Mikey Likes. It has uh, been a long and lousy day, but now it's better. Well, I'm glad it's better, Mikey Likes. You made my day better, too, by being here. And uh, with those 22 months of support, that's a long time, Mikey Likes. Thank you, thank you. I really appreciate that. Welcome back to Paleontologizing. How are you doing? Good to have you here. So, yeah. Yeah. S.B. Harkin says, the Parsons nose. Yes, the Pika style is also known as the Parsons nose. That little nubbin on the end of a bird's tail? Yeah. I wonder if there's a... Is there a chance we have a YouTube video about that? Um. Really spectacular. Spared no expense. Bliss Nine gifted a tier one yes. sub. Thank you, Bliss Nine. Thank you very, very much. Really appreciate that. Thank you for supporting uh, science here on Twitch. Appreciate you, Bliss Nine. Thank you, thank you. Yeah. Excellent. Uh, maybe this will talk about it? Yeah, the Sin Sacrum. Uh, there's different dinosaurs that have got the Sin Sacrum there. These are the hip bones. There's the hip socket, where the femur fits in right there. The acetabulum. There you go. Yeah. There's some Rias. Rias, Rias, tomato, potato. South American... Uh, flightless birds. And there's the piga style right there. These are the bones in the tail that all kind of like smush together. And they're a nice anchor point for tail feathers. All modern birds have this. Including pelicans. Yeah. And secretary birds. And whoever those are. Yeah, good stuff. Anyway, nifty little video. So the Piga style. Piga style. Is, uh... Yeah. Um... Here's a walkthrough of a bird skeleton. There's a... That's... Gallus Gallus. The chicken. Yeah. 
Let's get down to business. Let's find the Pyga style there. Yeah. Um, it is a very unique term. It is very unique. The well, I shouldn't say it's unique to vertebrae. caudal vertebrae. The just phalanges, and we have yeah. one thing to point out, and that is on the tail. This is a bunch of fused caudal vertebrae. Yeah. Pygo style. Pygo style. It's a very unique term. Yeah. The, well, I shouldn't say it's unique to birds, but there are several clades of theropod dinosaurs that um, develop a pygo style. Uh huh. But this guy knows what's up. You can be the only ones around anymore, I guess. <laughs> and they have it. <laughs> so if you take a look at the rib cage of the bird, um, you might notice a f some extra bone. Anyway, yeah, yeah, good stuff. Um, so yeah, yeah, the pygo style is that little nubbin at the end of the tail vertebrae. A bunch of vertebrae fused together into like a single little nubbin there Sincere that support the tail feathers. Thank you very much for the 100 bits. Thank you, Rizu Degu. Thank you so much for the 100 bits. Appreciate that very, very much. Thank you, thank you. And we've got a hype train going here, everybody. You know what the rule is for hype trains. If we manage to get to a level 5 hype train, which used to be the highest you could attain, no longer. Anyway, if we get to a level 5 at 100%, I'll play some ukulele songs about science. So we'll see if we can get there. In an unsuspecting world, living creatures from the dawn of time, what havoc will they wreak? What lives will they destroy? David Peterson. What panic and terror will they create? <laughs> David Peterson and their 58 raiders have arrived to wreak some sweet, sweet havoc. Sweet, sweet havoc indeed. How are you doing, David Peterson? It is great to see you. Welcome back to Paleontologizing. Wonderful to have you here. I hope you're doing really well. It's good to see you. Um, and holy moly, Murph. Uh-oh. We're gonna have to proceed with caution here. Because, uh... You may have overloaded our Tinamu bird here. It's only increasing here. Take cover! Murph is overloading the system with 10 gift subs. Holy cow, Murph. Thank you, thank you. Really, really appreciate that. That is extraordinary. Really appreciate that, Murph. Thank you for all those gift subs. And all those wonderful people who just got gift subs. That's thanks to Murph and their generosity. Appreciate you, Murph. And, um, wrong button. Here we go. David Peterson, Mouse Guard, Mouse Guardiers, Mouse Guardians. Um, how are you doing? How was your stream, David Peterson? I hope it was wonderful. Welcome back to Paleontologizing. It's great to see you. I hope things are good. Thank you for bringing everybody here. If anybody's here for the very first time, let me to introduce myself real quick. My name is Danny Anduza. I'm a dinosaur paleontologist. And I'm here on Twitch. Trying to do some good old fashioned science communication. Been talking about bird anatomy here and how birds inherited these traits of their anatomy from their dinosaur ancestors. We've been talking about, well, shoot, all kinds of stuff today. But anyway, David Peterson, thank you. Thank you for the raid. I, uh, and yes, indeed, Necromanty, the creator of Mouse Guard, is a Twitch streamer. Go follow David Peterson right now if you're not yet doing so. Can we get another shout out for David Peterson real quick? Yeah. Excellent stuff. Um, thank you. Thank you, David Peterson. Creator of the graphic novel series Mouse Guard. Yeah. Uh, go give their, go give his channel a, a once over. See if you might want to follow. Thank you, David Peterson. David, thank you so much for the raid. I really appreciate it. Yeah. So yeah. Yeah. Good stuff. We were talking about this Cretaceous bird, Confucius Ornus. 
And uh, there's that same illustration from our Dorling Kinder sleep book there. DK. Yeah. And apparently you can purchase a Confucius Ornus. Wow, it's not cheap, but it is beautiful. Look at that. Holy cow. Anyway, nice stuff. Thank you again, uh, Layered T, for redeeming that dinosaur deep dive there. That is good stuff. Now, I'm, I'm wondering if anybody here in chat might be new to paleontologizing, especially after that remarkable raid that we just got. If anybody here is new, if you are new, and if you would like to know what a paleontologist is doing here on Twitch right now, why a fossil scientist would be broadcasting on twitch.tv, type a one into chat, and I'll play for you a quick welcome video to help introduce you to the channel. If we had some new people typing in once, that would be helpful. <laughs> if it's just, if it's just, yeah, shoot. If it's all people who have been here, if everybody knows this, then we'll skip it, you know? But uh, if anybody is new, then we'll do it. But I'm not seeing any new people. You know, what I am seeing, though, is some remarkable support from Ash Girl there. Thank you. Ash underscore girl is getting serious with those five gift subs. Thank you, Ash Girl. Holy cow. Thank you. Thank you very, very much. I really appreciate that, Ash Girl. Thank you for treating five people to an ad-free viewing experience right there. Appreciate you, Ash Girl. That's wonderful. Yeah. Um, excellent. And Pippin Fool, how are you doing? Welcome, welcome to Paleontologizing. Pippin Fool, would you like to see a welcome video to introduce you to the channel to tell you what all this stuff is about? Let me know. You can be our deciding vote there. Yeah. Although we are very close to a level 5 hype train too, Moohoodles. You are correct. Yeah. And Pippin Full says, sure, that'll do it. That will do it. Without further ado, I'm going to introduce you to our good friend, previously recorded Danny. He's going to tell you a thing or two about uh, about this channel, about how I came to be here, about all that good stuff. So without further ado, I'll bring him on. And uh, there he is right there. I promise you're in good hands with him. Uh, spectacular. Spared no expense. And thank you, Lenina. They have really appreciate that, Lenina. Thank you. Thank you for your generosity. Pippin Fool, enjoy those, uh, those emotes and... Enjoy not having to watch the ads for the next 30 days. Good stuff. And uh, now you're not going to have to wait 30 days. Holy cow. Previously recorded, Danny, is raring to go. Go ahead and uh, take it away. Well, thanks for present day, Danny. Well, if you happen to be new around here, then welcome to Paleontologizing. You may well be wondering to yourself, uh, well, if this is Twitch, then where are the video games? to level with you here. I don't really do much in the way of video games. I'm a paleontologist. My name is Danny Anduza, and dinosaurs are my area of study. But how in the world does a paleontologist end up on Twitch? Well, you're about to find out. When I finished high school, I moved to Montana and immediately started work at the Museum of the Rockies, which at the time was an unparalleled powerhouse of paleobiology. That program was built by this guy. Famed paleontologist Alan Grant. Well, kind of. You consulted on that movie. I did consult on the, all and those movies. And they said the, the guy Alan Grant was you. <laughs> yes, yeah, well, fortunately he didn't get eaten. <laughs> <laughs> Meet Jack Horner, the real-life Alan Grant. 
He's one of the most prominent and controversial paleontologists in the country, a dyslexic MacArthur Foundation genius who never finished college and who says he doesn't care why dinosaurs went extinct. To him, the important part is how they lived. It was at Museum of the Rockies, under the auspices of Jack Warner, that I learned how to be a dinosaur paleontologist. And a huge part of that I learned by working with Jack's final graduate student, a guy by the name of Denver Fowler, who would later go on to become curator of the Badlands Dinosaur Museum. Working with Denver, I did summer after summer of fieldwork in the remote Badlands of Montana. Together, we dug up more dinosaurs than we knew what to do with, and fossil sites numbering in the hundreds. In 2012, I discovered a new species of ceratopsian dinosaur, hopefully soon to be published. The next year, we excavated the world's smallest and youngest Tyrannosaurus rex. Then, we dug up a brand new ankylosaur. Montana's news leader. Five paleontologists are excavating what looks to likely be a new species of armored dinosaur. So we found its head, and we found parts of its armor and plates, and so it, it should be a new species. Not bad, right? Well, anyway, much like my fieldwork, my research also focuses on dinosaurs. For example, here's Trirarchuncus, the last of the alvarosaurs, just published in July of 2020. One of my current projects focuses on spinosaurids. I can't really talk too much about that until it's a little bit closer to publication, so uh, stay tuned for that. Anyway, let's get back to how I ended up on Twitch. A couple years ago, things in Montana were declining rapidly. So I picked up and moved on to greener pastures. I'm so glad I did. And with that new perspective, I also realized that I have very little patience with the soul-crushing bureaucracy within academia. For the time being, anyway, I decided to take my career in a slightly different direction. I got hired for a job in early childhood education. As a teacher, I get to have a positive impact on kids' lives, to help them find a passion for science. Then, when COVID-19 showed up, the school had to close. But that didn't stop the teaching or the learning. We just moved online. All right, friends. So, we're going to be looking at a book in a little bit, but I thought we'd start off with a song. At three, two, two. one. <laughs> oh, give me a home where the hadrosaurs roamed, where triceratops bellowed and grazed, where erosion uncovers bones we seek to discover for to strike the whole world amazed. It was a pretty easy jump from teaching online to streaming on Twitch. I had my first broadcast in May, and I've been on here ever since. Now I believe pretty strongly that any good scientist should also be a public servant. In my opinion, talking to everyday people about her science is one of the most important things that a researcher can do. I now have a golden opportunity to reach out directly to people where they are. This is what I'm all about, and now thanks to Twitch, I get to share it with you, and I'm so happy to be able to do so. It's my intention to continue this mission of education by answering your questions, providing good science content, and working to grow this channel. And if you could help by following, or if you could afford it by subscribing, I would be deeply grateful. So anyway, to my regular viewers, thank you again for sitting through this. And to everybody who's new, welcome. Genuinely, earnestly glad that you're here. I hope you stick around. We've got a remarkable little community here, and uh, I'd be delighted if you join us. Anyway, uh, let's go ahead and get back into it. So, uh, 
Present day Danny, back to you. Well, thank you very much, previously recorded Danny. And of course, thank you even more to our friend David Peterson for that remarkable raid. Really appreciate that. And welcome to all the new folks. Uh, spectacular. Yeah. Um... As Lenina and Claire Burr both said, yeah, that video is a little bit old at this point. Um, I made that back in, uh, I think that was November of 2020. Shoot. I really need to make some updated versions of that. But, uh, it's a good while ago. I'll give you my message up front. Try not to go extinct. <laughs> That's it. Good advice. Uh... Kite Elric, how are you doing? Welcome to Paleontologizing. Thanks for the follow. Appreciate it. Welcome, welcome. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah. Yeah, good stuff. Good stuff. Good stuff. Um, and SV Harkin, you're trying. I appreciate you trying, SV Harkin. And link to that intro video, please. I don't... That's not anywhere online, Travel. Yeah. Sorry. It's only here on my hard drive. But, you know, I do have the, uh, my YouTube page is right there, and you can access that. I now post all of the VODs to YouTube, including, yeah, this one just went up. Excellent. Um, our VOD from Friday. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, good stuff. Anyway, the one from, uh, from Thursday somehow is still not up. It's got some sort of a copyright issue. YouTube is throwing a hissy fit over it. So anyway, many, many Dannys, Risa Dago. Many, many. So anywho, yeah. Good stuff. Good stuff. And, uh... Let's see. And uh, Kays says, where did you get that dope watch? If you don't mind my asking. I don't mind you asking, Kays. Let me show you. This is... Well, I got this watch as a gift from my grandfather when I... I think when I turned 18. I think this is for my 18th birthday. He got this for me. It was like this, too. Um, there's a bunch of grime on there. Ugh. Uh, but it's got that metal grate over the top. And he described it as a paratrooper's watch. That apparently it's similar to watches that U.S. paratroopers used in the Second World War II. I don't know if that's true or not. But, uh, but I like it a lot. This, the, the metal grate on it has saved the uh, the crystal on that watch from being smashed many, many times. I've worn a number of other watches in the field when I've been out digging dinosaurs. And usually at some point, the crystal on the watch, you know, the, the glass part on here ends up getting cracked or smashed or shattered. I've never had that happen with this watch here. So I've been wearing it, shoot, I can't tell you how many years. But a long time. It's good stuff. So, yeah. Yeah. Um, and thank you, Case. I appreciate you. Welcome, welcome to Paleontologizer. Now, I figure right now is probably a good time for us to continue. Uh, our video... From... Where was that? Uh, well, let me just find it real quick. We're not going to find the exact URL, so let's go through YouTube search. There we go. We were watching this a few days ago. And, uh, Harjamano, thank you for the follow. Welcome to Paleontologizing. Good to have you here. Yeah, City Patty, there you go, Golganek. Yes. This looks like it might be paleontologist Mark Norell behind the wheel of this vehicle right here. Let's go back a little bit. 
Let's go back to right here, perhaps? Yeah. Good stuff. Uh, this is... Well, here is an American Museum of Natural History crew from the 1920s working through the Mongolian desert trying to find fossils. And then in the 1990s, a crew returned, and we're kind of following their journey here. I'll catch up. Yeah. There we go. Imagine that the roads have gotten better. They have not. <laughs> ah, uh, yeah. Aren't built for a desert like the Gobi. Hey, Anna No Evil, how you doing? Welcome, welcome. And we don't know what it is. It's not. Yeah. Oh, this is what we were laughing about last time. <laughs> these, all these Russian-made vehicles. Oh, boy. We have an electrical problem, and we don't know what it is. <laughs> I remember last time, last time I had to pull up a clip. Um, yeah. Yeah. There we go. Uh, yeah. <laughs> anyway, that's what this reminded of us, reminded us of last time. And so, uh, yeah, uh, you'd say Unimog. There you go, PX Run. No, it's, it's more obscure than that. This is a, I think, a Russian gas truck. And the fact that the N in the phrase made in Russia is backwards here just made me laugh out loud last time. So, uh, anyway, we're continuing this here. And, uh, here is an American crew of paleontologists and volunteers uh, linking up with some Mongolians and some other people from other countries as well, digging up dinosaurs in the, the wilds of the Gobi Desert of Mongolia. It's not a very complicated wiring plan of Russian Jeep. And they keep running into engine like issues, vehicle problems. Yeah. Oh, boy. They're up and running. But next, it's a truck's turn. Oh, boy. Piston, huh? We think it's piston number six. <laughs> A critical breakdown could have severe consequences. End of the expedition, if not the end of our lives. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe we'll make it. So. Oh, God. By the way, I was telling you the story of, um, of back in 2013. We were watching this, you know, last week. When, uh... Yeah, and in the Society of Vertebrate Paleontology meeting, there was a dramatic story where I, you, you trade name tags at the end of the conference, and it's kind of a tradition, and you try and trade up to get the best name tag that you can. And I managed to get Mark Norell's name tag. Let me see if I can find that real quick while we continue this. I'm going to go dig through some of my stuff here in my office. Let me see if I can find it. I will be right back as I continue this. <laughs> Maybe we'll make it. Oh, God. With the nearest gas station some 500 miles away, and time already getting tight, things will have to go smoothly from now on. Oh, we're having some mechanical problems. We we think it's a fuel pump, but we're not sure. This could be way bad. It seems to me I got this thing in there without doing that, the twisty deal. <laughs> Maybe we'll tow it or... Oh. Abandon it. Abandon <laughs> it. Get on with it. That we can't stay here more than a day. After more than 12 breakdowns, the vehicles all decide to run at the same time. As they enter the dusty dinosaur fields of the Gobi, they're traveling a long way, backwards in time.
Dinosaurs first appeared some 230 million years ago in a world with a different face. The creatures were thriving a hundred million years later as South America and Africa split apart. About 75 million years ago, in the late Cretaceous period, dinosaurs began to disappear, leaving only bones behind. Their bones were more motionless than the continents. Then in the 1920s, Roy Chapman Andrews came to a remote place in the Gobi Desert he would name the Flaming Cliffs. It was a likely looking place. There appeared to be medieval castles with spires and turrets, brick red in the evening light, colossal gateways, walls and ramparts, a labyrinth of ravines and gorges studded with fossil bones make a paradise for the paleontologist. Without a doubt, there were hundreds of bones lying just beneath the surface. But where? If only my eyes could pierce that baffling surface and get a glimpse of what lay concealed. Within minutes, they were finding fossils. Andrews and his team had stumbled onto the mother load of dinosaur bones. They discovered the remains of some 200 different animals, many of them completely new species. The fossils revealed a world that Andrews found alien and terrifying. Dinosaurs were the sort of creatures you might think of as inhabiting another planet, or the kind you dream of in a bad nightmare. <laughs> It was an image our culture nourished for generations. Ah. Dinosaurs were Can't find it. Monstrous. That's okay. I need to do some cleaning around here. And not all that yeah. <laughs> Excuse me. Many of the new ideas about dinosaurs are coming from the amazing boneyard called Uka Tolgad. Uka Tolgad, yes. The site three years ago. Now, to get to That's, the dinosaurs, uh, all they have to do is find it again. You could, Uka Tolgad. There you go. The maps in general are pretty lousy for the Gobi Desert. One million times. Really, Lilithobo. <laughs> We don't even pay any attention to any of the roads marked on those maps. They're completely wrong. Oh, man. Even a satellite Imagine that. Doesn't always help. <laughs> You're looking at maps and they're, they're just like completely wrong. It's like they're showing you all these roads that should exist and they're like, no, in reality, they're not there. Those maps are fantasies. You know? Yeah. Holy cow. That's, uh... Yeah, and there you go, Jesus. Yeah, that looks fun getting lost in the desert. Yes, indeed. Oh, know where you are. oh boy. The road you need may be in a completely different direction. Uh. So it's the roads here are very confusing. There are no signs, and and many of them lead nowhere. Yep. <laughs> Mondo Lobo. Mondo Lobo, sir. So. <laughs> Yeah. By the way, if any of you would like to, so this documentary is just like kind of short form compared to, compared to a book by this guy, Michael Novacek. The book is called Dinosaurs of the Flaming Glyphs, and I cannot recommend it highly enough. I have it here up on my shelf. It is right up there. It's the black one right there. There you go. But Dinosaurs of the Flaming Cliff is an extraordinary book. Some of the... Uh... There we go. Dinosaurs of the Flaming Cliffs by Michael Novacek. One of the best popular books ever written about dinosaurs, in my opinion. And you can get it there on Thrift Books... 
for hopefully pretty cheap. Anyway, here's a link while that page loads. Time Traveler by Michael Novacek, also very good. Arguably better, in my opinion, Press Scion. Yeah, really, really good stuff. Um, but yeah, there you go. You can get it wherever fine books are sold, or you can get it here on Thrift Books for real cheap. Or you can call up your local independent bookseller, local independent bookshop, and ask for that Dinosaurs of the Flaming Cliffs by Michael Novacek. One of the most entertaining books you will ever read. It is really, really good stuff. I'm not kidding. It's, uh, it's pretty excellent. Check it out. Can't say enough good things about it. So, yeah. Yeah. And you love this documentary? I did too, Lenina. I've watched this multiple times with other paleontologists in the field, like on rain days and stuff like that. I might even watch it again this next year. We'll have to see. Um, if my crew gets rained out again. I'm gonna make sure this is on my hard drive. But, uh, this is, uh, this is good stuff. Anyway, there's Michael Novacek. Right there. Yeah. Um, we're a little off course. We're not really lost. We're just a, we're just a bit off course. So we've got to go this away and that away. Yeah. Uh. At times, you have to go in circles to move forward. Sure. Yeah. Roy Chapman Andrews, too, spent more than a few days wandering the Gobi. So this is why we're watching this, is because last week we started this on the birthday of Roy Chapman Andrews, famed American explorer, who was born on January 26th, 1884. Oh, yeah. In the end, he yeah. wandered into a discovery that stunned the world. A member of his expedition literally stumbled across a critical link in the great chain of being. Ah. Uh... On July 13th, George Olson reported that he had found some fossil eggs. Ah, uh, yeah. Take his story very seriously. Nevertheless, we were all curious enough to go with him to inspect his find. And he was but right. No mistake. Our paleontologist finally said, "Gentlemen, there is no doubt about it. You are looking at the first dinosaur egg ever found." Oh boy, yeah. <laughs> Ah, good stuff. The discovery made Roy Chapman Andrews a national hero. Uh-huh. The eggs were not alone. Lying above the nest was a bizarre skeleton. A bird-like dinosaur unknown to man. Hmm. It had apparently been caught in the act of murder, stealing the eggs. So it was forever cursed with the name Oviraptor. Uh. Latin for egg thief. Egg thief. It yeah. Be before we discovered the strange truth about the animal called Oviraptor. This is true. Very, very true. Dinosaur Dave has requested Lynn Henicus for a dinosaur deep dive there. And they got caught red-handed. Well, we'll talk about that, wimp womp, because there might be more to the story about Oviraptor. This is that part of the true crime documentary where uh, where they've got like a big misdirect. Because, hmm. you know, it turns out it wasn't the, uh, the store clerk who did it. Turns out it was the police chief who uh, ate all of those cheerleaders or whatever. I don't know how these things work. I don't watch true crime stuff. Um, but let's do that, uh, let's do that dinosaur deep dive there for Dinosaur Dave Linhanicus, which is an Alvarosaurid, if I remember correctly. Yeah, Linhanicus is a beautiful little Alvarosaurid, also from the Gobi Desert of Mongolia. One of these critters. Yeah... Let me, uh, let me talk about this critter a little bit. Let me talk about its relatives. Yeah. 
Let's talk about Mononychus, which is a better known critter from this group, Mononychus. So when you're thinking of Linhonychus, this is basically the same kind of animal. Let's take a look. Yeah. This is what we call an alverisaur. Very long, stilty legs. Very short forelimbs with a single powerful claw on each hand. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> Very nice. Look at those juicy termites. Ooh. <laughs> Yeah. Wookie Gaming, thank you. I appreciate that, Wookie Gaming. Thank you, thank you so much. I really appreciate your kind words and those 100 bits. Thank you for your support. That means a lot. You know, I, I'm here on Twitch trying to get people interested in science, trying to teach them about... The natural world about the incredible history of life on our amazing planet Earth, including wonderful critters like this. Thank you for supporting me in that Wookie Gaming. Appreciate you. Yeah. An excellent protein packed meal. If only termites weren't quite so irritating. <laughs> uh. Yeah. Anyway, that's this animal. Thank you, Wookie Gaming, for the 200 bits. Really appreciate that, Wookie Gaming. Thank you, thank you. Excellent. So this is part of a group of animals called the Alverosaurids. Here's Mononychus right here. Linhonychus belongs to the same group. They've got a really weird body plan. These long, stilty legs. They probably would have been very fast runners. Flexible neck right here. Kind of toothless or almost toothless jaws for most of these taxa. And then they've got these ridiculously robust forelimbs. Very short, one big claw. That's their thumb claw right there. Just crazy, crazy weird animals. Alverosaurids. Let's look up Linhonychus in particular. It's a member of this group. Uh, Linhonychus. Here on Wikipedia. It's an Alverosaurid. And the known parts of the skeleton are there in white. It's a little subtle. So we've got femurs, we've got forelimbs, we've got a tail for the most part. Most of the torso is missing, although we've got those claws there. Nice. Yeah from Inner Mongolia, China. And is the bas most basal known member of Parvicursorinae. All right. Uh, uh, yeah. And uh, it was from late Cretaceous Wulan Suhai formation of Ne Mongol, Inner Mongolia, China. About 75 to 71 million years ago. So maybe a little bit older than Mononychus, perhaps. Uh, interesting. Is it from the same formation as Parvicursor? Baron Goyet formation. Interesting. Anyway, some of these critters are going to get synonymized at some point. It's just a matter of whom and when. But yeah, take a look at these. Linhonychus. What a cool animal. Lovely illustration by Julius Chitney right there. Yeah. Excellent. 
Very, very cool. Let's see if we can find the original descriptive paper, perhaps. This critter was described in 2011. Uh, can we find that? There we go. A monodactyl non-avian dinosaur in the complex evolution of the Averisauroid hand. There is the original paper. Here is a link, which I am copy-pasting into chat right now. Take a look at that. Danger nubs indeed. Necromanty, yes. Yes. And it is a theropod with a backwards-facing pubis. Yeah, the more a lot of Manoraptoran theropods have a backwards-facing pubis. Tommy Platicus, yeah. Velociraptor has that? Shoot. There's a plastic model of a Velociraptor skeleton right here with, would you know, a backwards pointing pubis right there. Yeah. The most bird-like dinosaurs have this. Yeah. That's totally a thing. Yeah. Anyway, there is the original descriptive paper for Lynn Hanikus. When I do a dinosaur deep dive, I try and show you the original, you know, paper associated with these critters. Uh, the paper that initially brought them to light to the scientific community, and this is that right there. Uh, yeah, lots of authors on this. Holy cow. Xu Xing, first author. As is often the case, there's that same figure that we saw in the Wikipedia article. There are some of the bones figured, including this beautiful Arcto Metatarsalian. Uh, Metatarsals right here. Very nice. So yeah. Yeah. Good stuff. Short paper in the journal PNAST. Proceedings of the National Academy of the Sciences. PNAS. PNAS. Uh, so yeah. And Kevin Padian was editor. Very cool. Uh, Kevin Padian lives right here in the Bay Area. Yeah. Uh, very cool stuff. So yeah. Cool. Thank you. Thank you, Dinosaur Dave. For that, uh, that deep dive right there. Very nice. Where were we before we were talking about that? Shoot. I don't even remember. Um, but yeah. Yeah. All the better to grip their snacks with, says Necromancy. You know, yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah, we were... Oh, oh shoot. I got rid of, uh... Hi everyone, so today we'll talk about uh, the bird. Derp. We were going through this documentary here. There we go. We're talking about Overaptor. Yes, indeed. The finally said, Gentlemen, there is no doubt about it. You are looking at the first dinosaur egg ever found. Ah. Uh... Now, these weren't actually the first dinosaur eggs ever found. There were some found in France from what we now identify as Hypsalosaurus that were far earlier. Although those weren't identified as dinosaur eggs at the time, they were discovered far earlier, back in the 1800s. And then there were dinosaur eggshell fragments found in Montana back in 1903. But those did not receive widespread attention. So for most intents and purposes, these were recognized as the first dinosaur eggs ever found, even though, strictly speaking, that wasn't true. But in the 1920s, they thought these were the first dinosaur eggs, you know? Yeah. There you go, Ash Girl. Yes. France did have them beat. Yeah. The discovery made Roy Chapman Andrews a national hero. Yeah. The eggs were not alone. Lying above the nest was a bizarre skeleton. Ooh. A bird-like dinosaur unknown to man. Huh. It had apparently been caught in the act of murder. Oh, no. The eggs. <gasps> so dun, it was dun. forever cursed with the name Overraptor. Special Victims Unit. Or egg Thief. Egg Thief. It would be years before we discovered the strange truth about the animal called Overraptor. Yeah... Mm. Once again, maybe railroaded poor over after. But yeah, 
It was a setup, says Necromancy. <laughs> uh. In the late 20s, the winds of change blew fiercely over the great dinosaur fields of Mongolia. Uh. That's when Roy Chapman Andrews was forced to leave the Gobi forever. There you go, Tommy Platicus. It is the same skeleton. Yeah. That Central Asia was a paleontology garden of Eden. Still, we have shown the way, have broken trail, as it were. Later, others will reap a rich harvest. Yes, indeed. Quite rich. <laughs> Uh. Decades later, Mark and Mike are hoping to find the treasures that Andrews left untouched in the sand. Hmm. After more than a week in the blistering Gobi, they finally reach their goal, the brown hills of Uka Tolgad. Yeah! <laughs> I recognize some of these people. They've only got two weeks to work. Oh, this is two the weeks. Pinned all their hopes. With luck, a year of shifting sands has exposed more bones. But even here, there are no guarantees. That's true. It is possible to fail in the Gobi. It's a huge area, a huge tract of land. There are lots of rocks, but they don't all contain fossils. You yep. can drive to what looks like the most tantalizing set of badlands and you can possibly after, yeah. imagine and not find one scrap of bone. That looks like Luis Chiappe right there. Theropod and bird dinosaur specialist, Luis Chiappe. I think it probably is. And there you go, Moonrise Rabbit. Yes, indeed. And all that trouble for two weeks of digging? Yeah, Lenina. I mean, that's how it often goes. Yeah, can you believe it? Yeah. It's a treasure hunt in a way, and uh, it is sort of like finding a needle in a haystack. But on this day, discovery and elation are immediate. I see. Ah. Yeah, oh, ooh. Wonderful. <laughs> appreciation and gratitude. Thank you very much for the 100 bits. And thank you. The oldest dinosaur that we know of. Wookie Gaming, thank you for those 100 bits. I really appreciate that. The oldest dinosaur that we know of right now? Well, lucky for you. I have it here. Right here. In my office right now. In fact... It's right there. Let me grab it off the shelf. You ready? This is the skull of Eoraptor. Eoraptor is just about the earliest dinosaur that we have, like, confirmed right now. It's not, it's surely not the oldest dinosaur that ever lived. It's not the very first dinosaur. But it's one of the oldest ones that we've got right now. And if you were to ask a hundred dinosaur paleontologists what is the oldest dinosaur, you'll probably get 70 answers that say, oh yeah, Eoraptor. Eoraptor. So let's talk about that a little bit. Yeah. Baby Herrerasaurus. It seems to probably be different from Herrerasaurus, but we'll we'll see, Claire Burr. That's a good question. That is a good question. Yeah. Uh, Eoraptor. We've got from rocks that I think are even a tiny bit older than Herrerasaurus. The animal looks something like this. You know, there's its little skull right there. Eoraptor. Like the very earliest dinosaurs, it walked on two legs. It was carnivorous. It is so early on that we're not even entirely sure what dinosaur group it should belong to. Is it a theropod? Is it a sauropod? Is it more basal to both of those? What is going on with little Eoraptor there? 
Well, it is facing off against one of our little ancestors. Early proto-mammal type thing. Maybe a tiny little early, early mammal. Let's snap that up and eat it. Um, yeah, Eoraptor. Um, and there's... Oh, I love this illustration of it here. But shoot, it's a Facebook illustration. Can we get... Facebook illustrations don't come up well on Google Images. It's lousy. Anyway, there's another Eoraptor. I like that too. That's pretty good. Anyway, yeah. Eoraptor. There is a Wikipedia link if you'd like to read more about this critter. But there you go. Eoraptor. Yeah. Captain Eoraptor. Very funny, Trappy Dragons. Yeah. With uh, with Michael Jackson, right? <laughs> ah, yeah, yeah. Anyway, uh, and Anna, no evil, Dipsy do sort of play that. Fine, Tings. I don't, I don't know what you mean, Anna. What? Buried, hidden. I'm not sure what you're saying, Anna, but I appreciate you being here. Yeah. Um, anyway, there you go, Wookie Gaming. There you go, EO Raptor. Uh, maybe we'll find a can we find a quick video on EO Raptor, perhaps. Hmm. Oh, this is nifty. Let's take a quick look at this right here. Come on now. Load, please, YouTube. Yeah. Dicynodonts? Dicynodonts, but whatever. Yeah. Uh... <laughs> Yeah, probably not super common back then. <laughs> yeah. And Hojo Cat, yeah, lots of Bowie songs on this broadcast. You know how it goes. Uh, uh oh, there's a big. Sorosukian or Nithosukians? Yeah. Run, little Eoraptor, run. I don't know how I feel about this documentary. It's a little, like, sensationalistic. And kind of disjointed. Like, it's hard to follow what's going on here. Okay. Now this is science, says Necromancy. Oh, boy. <laughs> hmm. Interesting. Very speculative, Claire Burr, indeed. We we don't know hardly anything about the anatomy or behavior or 
individual variation, sexual dimorphism of Eoraptor. But, yeah, I don't know. Yeah. Evidently, they were super cute. There you go, SV Harkin. Well, there you go. Actually, that's that's a perfect place to uh, to leave this on SV Harkin because they were super cute. Eoraptor, if you're going to take anything at all away from this little sequence right here, it should be that the earliest dinosaurs were small. They walked on two legs. They ate meat. They were probably pretty cute, you know? Would have looked something like that. Dinosaurs don't start off really, really big. They start off small and two-legged and looking like that. Only later would big four-legged dinosaurs evolve. Dinosaurs start off small and walking on two legs. They're very tiny and cute. There you go. Yeah. And were the males more colorful? That may have been the case. And a no evil? Yes. Um... That's definitely the case with most modern birds, where the males are more colorful. If there's any kind of difference at all between males and females, which sometimes there isn't, you know, sometimes they're, like, identical, except for, like, what's going on underneath their feathers. It very well could be that the, uh, the you know, male dinosaurs were much more brightly colored than females. That's it's often the case in a lot of critters. So, yeah. Because the eggs are expensive. Exactly. Necromanty, Yes. Yes. Got to save those resources. Not for coloration, but for... But for ensuring the next generation. Yeah. Was there a bleak colorless history on bird evolutions? In? No, there, there are some birds that are brightly colored and others that are much more drab. Anno? Yeah. It also bears... Uh, it, it bears consideration that birds can see more colors than we can. So to you and me, you know, a crow or a raven. Yeah, you know, they look pretty plain and black like that. But... There we go. To another bird, they might be very colorful indeed. They actually have colors in their plumage that we cannot even really decipher because our eyes can't see the colors that those feathers are. Like, th these birds can see partway into the ultraviolet spectrum. We can see the very beginnings of that and their iridescence, but, like, our eyes and our brains cannot decipher those colors. We didn't evolve to see that. These birds can see more colors than we can, and dinosaurs would have been able to do the same thing. Which is so cool, right? Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. And no cones respond to the UV. There you go, where ducky. Yes, indeed. Yeah. Yeah. So, anyway. Another time, we will go through and watch the rest of this. But for right now, it's getting a little bit late here. I've been going for four and a half hours almost here. It's time for me to go ahead and wrap up today's broadcast and start getting ready for tomorrow. I've got some more science to do tonight. So here's an Archaeopteryx to run underneath our credits real quick. And, uh, oh, come on, Streamlabs. You can do it. Run our credits, please. There we go. We're going to find somebody else who is doing some science here on Twitch. Thank you to everybody whose names show up here in the credits. I appreciate you very, very much. Especially you cheers and moderators and followers. Good stuff. Let's see who is here on Twitch at the moment. Um... Yeah. You know what? It has been forever since we've gone to go see Speedify Live. Why don't we go check them out? I did an interview with Speedify Live, which you can find on YouTube. But uh, let's go check them out right now. 
Uh. Yeah. Uh, cool stuff. Everybody, thank you so much for another wonderful stream. I hope you had a lot of fun tonight. I know I did. Thank you for all of your financial support. First and foremost, could not do this without that level of support, so thank you, thank you. Um, thank you for all of the wonderful questions. Thank you for your enthusiasm and your viewership. Thank you, moderators, for all your hard work. I appreciate you being here day in, day out. It means a lot to me. It really does. And I appreciate that. And, uh, yeah. Everybody, I'll be back tomorrow, 2 p.m. California time, for some more paleontology content. We'll probably be discussing some fossil news. If there are any new discoveries that are announced, published between now and then, then you'll figure out tomorrow when we uh, when we cover that. But until then, everybody, you take care of yourselves. Thank you so much for being here. Let's go check out Speedify Live. I'll see you there. All right. Bye-bye.